February 23rd, 2023. Um, thank you for joining us both in person and online for the Burlington City Council meeting. The time is uh, 5.40. Uh, we have a quorum uh, and we're gonna begin with a public hearing. So not everyone has quite arrived yet, but we do have a quorum. Um, we're gonna begin our agenda this evening with item 1.01, which is a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, would somebody willing, be willing to make that motion? Uh, thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Seconded by Councillor McGee. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? All those in, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That gives us our agenda, which I am going to get to myself. Uh, the second item on our agenda is the second public hearing regarding charter changes for the November 7th, 2023 um, ballot. Um, would also like to add that uh, Councillor Freeman is joining us via Zoom. Um, thanks so much for, for being here, Councillor Freeman. Um, we'll op we'll be, we're gonna open the public hearing, but before we do, I uh, just wanted to make a note that um, as noted on board docs, members of the public are welcome to speak for up to two minutes during the public hearing. And in the interest of allowing everyone to be heard, if you did speak at the January 17th public hearing, please limit your comments to the charter changes that you didn't speak to at the first hearing. Um, we've allotted 30 minutes for the public hearing and are gonna try very hard to honor, um, honor that time limit so that we can get on with the rest of our meeting at the last public hearing, as you may recall, that was our only item on the agenda. Um, for the benefit of the public, just so um, for those who haven't perhaps been following it as closely, uh, the reason we do these uh, public hearings is due to 17 VSA 2645, and that, it, that in part says that a charter change can be proposed by the legislative body of the municipality or by 5% of the voters. Um, among the other aspects of this statute is that the legislative body shall hold at least two public hearings prior to the meeting to vote on the charter proposals. So this is the second of two such hearings. We'll open the public hearing at seven, I'm sorry, at five, uh, 544. And we have a couple of people um, in person who wish to speak. Uh, the first is uh, Sinead Murray. And um, Sinead, are you present? Please come, please come and uh, come to the table. Welcome and thanks for being here. Like that? Perfect. Um, I was here last week and I was planning to again make a comment in support of ranked choice voting, but after hearing that you prefer me not to, I'll restrain and just say um, that like with the 12 6 special election, VPIRC is planning a comprehensive and robust um, voter education program. Um, I'm seeing my East District Counselor, Maya Brandt. Um, it's nice to see you again. Um, we held a candidate training and are planning to do the same. Um, and I would just like to thank you all for being here and for taking the time to listen to the public and for your tireless work on so many of the pro-democracy charter change items on the back of the ballot. And thanks so much. Thank you, thanks for being here. Um, the other person who wanted to speak who is here in person is actually not here right at this moment. So I'll, I'll go to the next speaker, which are speakers that are, that are joining us online. And there is only one who asked to speak in the, I believe there's only one who is asking to speak in the public hearing, and that is um, Ken Casella. Um, although I do see uh, two people that have raised their hand, and don't worry, I see you and I will come back to you. Um, Ken Casella, I found you and enabled your microphone if you'd like to speak now. Thank you very much for giving me a moment to speak. You can hear me, I trust? Yes, we can hear you just great. Very good, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, I oppose the proposed control board in its current form, and any oversight that we do have, I think must include field professionals. Ms. Hightower was quoted in Vermont Digger today, I read it, saying that this is no different than a financial audit, but wouldn't it be prudent to have an accountant do a financial audit? 
The Board of Dental Examiners for the state of Vermont has six dentists on the board, and that seems logical to me. Policing is not romantic, and it's not moonlight and mistletoe. Every day, our police officers wear a bulletproof vest. Why? Because they, they put their lives on the line serving our community every day. Your proposal, your proposed panel will not know what it's like to respond to a domestic violence call or a shots fired incident. Law enforcement officers are clearly better educated to handle these and review the outcomes of these matters. Burlington Police Department is having a terrible time filling its ranks and retaining officers. We need trained and compassionate personnel. This proposal discourages new hires. It is a noose that looms over them. It's a sign of distrust and it is the wrong action. When we need, what we need now is our collective outstretched hand offering support and confidence in our police department. Legitimate oversight's a good thing, but this charter change is not. It is short-sighted and it's arrogant. It will do nothing to strengthen our police force that we so desperately need to keep our streets and our parks safe. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, there were two people, actually there is one other person who did wanna speak um, in the public hearing on charter changes and that is Sharon Busher. Um, so Sharon, um, I've enabled your microphone if you wanted to speak during this uh, part of the, the um, part of the meeting. Um, yes, I did. Thank you. I want to speak to two topics. One is I was excited to see that the Vermont Supreme Court upheld the ruling that um, non-citizen voters can vote in Montpelier and throughout the state. And well, that, that wasn't the specific question, but it really gives more credence to our ballot item. So I was excited about that um, and support that um, charter change. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention does have to do with redistricting, but I'm going to focus on the memo that Megan Tuttle sent to you for your agenda, which is linked to um, the map, the new map that was put forward and um, drawn and for consideration, which is the 27 version one version two. Um, in that communication, Megan says that if this map is supported, that the district needs to be one and two and three and eight. And yet the deviations done quickly, um, she says because of deviations, but she doesn't really give the percentages when doing that really quickly and consulting with Earhart Monka, who I don't believe is gonna be here tonight, um, uh, the deviations are under 10%. I think that it really is not a healthy thing to divide the old North End in wards two and three. I think they are, have been a district for forever. And I don't think a new map like this necessitates that uh, co combination. And I wanted to speak against that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, so before we go back into Contois, because there are two people who've asked to speak in Contois, um, there are three people who have their hand up and I'm assuming online, I'm assuming that you have your hand up uh, to speak during the public hearing. So the first person that I see is Margaret Joyle and um, I've, en I've enabled your microphone. Uh, Margaret, if you wanted to speak now. Great, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, so my name is Margaret Joyle. I live in the Five Sisters neighborhood. I moved to Burlington in 1985. I've raised my family here. Um, I want to speak tonight about the community, community control of the police, but I, but I wanna raise a separate issue uh, connected to all that, which is that I believe we in fact don't, I and many of my members of my community don't trust our police force. We have seen things happen that are uh, not acceptable. Uh, the discrimination against mental health survivors, uh, violence towards people of color in our city, um, lies about funding and uh, frankly, um, absolute refusal to come to people's homes when really frightening things are happening at those homes. And uh, I find that unacceptable. 
uh, in the deepest way. I would like to call for a consent decree. I'd like to pull in a Department of Justice. I'm sure there are many things wrong with the ballot item that need, you know, clarification and um, and cleaning up. And I think our legislature probably would be up for doing that. I think it's bad enough that we need to think about it, uh, asking the Department of Justice to come in. So that's what I wanted to say tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next person who had raised their hand is Erhard Monke, and uh, Erhard, I've enabled your microphone and you should be able to speak now. Uh, thank you, President uh, Paul. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, sorry not to be there in person. We had an emergency in the apartment upstairs. Uh, and I do want to quickly um, speak to the charter change, uh, the new information on the charter change. Uh, first, to thank you for uh, having V27 drafted up by city staff. Uh, as you know, I, I still uh, support that. But uh, in terms of the other two um, maps that were drawn up, the tweaks, V1 and V2, Erhard, I apologize. We yeah. we do we are really trying to limit um, limit people to speaking to the, a charter change. Um, if they've already spoken to a charter change at the January seventeenth meeting, to trying to limit their comments to other charter changes. If there are I, others that you wish to speak to, I just wanted to say that of the tweaks, I would support V two if you can't support the V twenty seven map. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, the uh, other person who had raised their hand is Sam Sam McGinty. And Sam, I've enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now if you'd like. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Uh, for the record, my name is Sam McGinty. I'm the democracy advocate with VPIRG and a Ward 2 voter. I want to start off by sincerely thanking the council for being here today and spending the time tonight listening to uh, voters' public comments. Um, there's a lot of hard work on some of these pro-democracy reforms before you today. As you know, VPIRC supports expanding ring choice voting, and I could spend my time talking about how great it is, but that's not why I'm here tonight. Instead, I'd like to focus on how VPIRC is planning on helping advance the ring choice voting charter change before you. And if not more importantly, how VPIRG is planning to educate voters who are using the system for the first time in the city council races. We're planning on working with voters, candidates in the city to help ensure that a successful election um, and that everyone has the information they need for town meeting day. With our robust membership in Burlington, organizing abilities and resources, we're well positioned to help advance this charter change proposal and make the voting experience for city council elections a success. As you know, this isn't going to be new for all voters, and voters in Warden 8 in the East District got a taste on the 12-6 election. By all indications, it was a huge success. Uh, we have a strong arsenal of voter education materials that we use for that election, including a candidate training. Councilor Brandt, so good to see you here virtually. Uh, we partnered with a national organization, and all three candidates attended that. We also did door-to-door -door canvassing, phone banking throughout the East District, leafleted, did some paid advertising. Uh, education advertising and had staff posted at polling locations throughout the day to help answer questions. Uh, we plan on doing all of these efforts and more ahead of the town meeting day vote so that all voters can feel prepared going into the ballot box to vote um, and working to help expand this to all future elections uh, to make sure that elections in Burlington are improved um, and more functional throughout the city. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we'll go back to Contois. Uh, there, there's no one else who has their hand raised or anyone who wants to speak in the public hearing that is registered online, although you're still, um, you're still welcome to do so. Um, the first, we have two speakers um, who wanted to speak in Contois that I hadn't called on. The first is Farid, and the second is Robert Bristow Johnson. Farid, welcome. Thank you. Um, so one of the objections that's been raised about the community oversight of police ballot items is that no other department in the city is subjected to such standard. Uh, but let's keep in mind that there's no other department in the city is empowered to take people's lives to uh, cause permanent injury and to deprive us of our liberty either. Um, if we're gonna give this power 
to somebody who works for the city, um, we should be asking for a much higher standard of, um, of conduct. When a firefighter was recorded on a camera pushing a man onto the street, within 24 hours, he announced resignation from, from, the, from the fire department. When we have police on camera beating up on civilians, they got voted as the leader of the fraternal order of the police. How are we supposed to trust those people? And if, I don't know if you've looked into fraternal order of the police, their parent organization, it is a right-wing organization that is uh, that supports white nationalism, a big Trump supporter, uh, opposed Black Lives Matter. It is opposed to everything that Burlington values. How are we supposed to trust our safety to people who hate us and hate our values? Um, I want to echo Margaret's call for a Department of Justice consent decree. I don't think this ballot item, although I will be voted, voting yes, uh, I don't think it goes far enough. There is zero trust in the police department. And people who are supposed to be uh, holding them accountable are instead like enabling the kind of problematic behaviors that over time has caused the trust of the community to be lost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go to Robert Bristow Johnson and then uh, Chris Hasley. This is about only quantity. So I'm going to read it. So all of these gains that we want from ranked choice voting, that's promised by ranked choice voting, is more diverse candidates running uh, and sometimes more diverse candidates elected. We want to level the playing field between independent and third party candidates and the major party candidates. We want to level that playing field. To do that, we have to disincentivize, disincentivize tactical voting. We don't, we don't want people being forced to pick the lesser of evils and uh, uh, because they don't want to see the candidate that they hate the most elected, all right? In order to do that, we have to avoid the spoiler effect. That's where we get quantitative and material. We can actually measure whether or not we avoid the spoiler effect. And in order to do that, we have to ensure that the candidate with consistent majority support, the candidate that we like better, if we like A better, we like them better than B, we like the candidate A better than C, we like candidate A better than D. We have to assure that that candidate is elected because all of this hinges on the, the consistent majority candidate being elected because if you do that, and if you don't do that, if a different candidate is elected, then you're guaranteed to have a spoiled election. It has to happen. It turns out that the loser in the final round is the spoiler, always, when this failure happens. This failure happened in 2009 here in this city. It happened in Alaska in August, the special election in August. And it had a different way this happened in Minneapolis in 2021. Now, uh, uh, what happened here was uh, Montreal was preferred by 4,064 voters in Burlington. They marked, they said, Andy Montreal is a better choice than Bob Kiss. Bob Kiss was preferred over Andy Montreal, 3,476 voters, 588 few voters, yet Bob Kiss was elected. In Alaska, uh, 87,000 voters said that Nick Begich was a better choice. 79,000 said Mary Peltola was a better choice, yet Mary Peltola was elected. Now, uh, it's, if that happens, if that spoiler happens, then you end up punishing a bunch of voters for their sincere choice. You then have a problem with third party candidates running, and in this town, the third party is the Republican Party. They, ha I know. They have to be able to be, feel free to run a candidate without getting burned by siphoning votes from the Democrats and having somebody else get burned. Then there Robert, is another, all right. I apologize. Um, I, I do know that you had intended to be at the first public hearing and would have, in, would have spoken. I would have. I, I understand that. And so if you can wrap it up in the next 30 okay. seconds, that would be great. 30 seconds. The other issue, this is what's getting this attention from the state government, is that of precinct summability, which is a component of process transparency that we need to keep elections honest, and also to get election results on election night. 
So you might have noticed that in Alaska, they didn't have a, a results until 15 days after the election. Maine, it was about eight days. New York City was about seven days. And it's not because computers are slow, it's because you, for hair IRV, you have to get all of the ballot data, individual ballot data, into the same centralized computer in order to have tabulation. Now, if you don't do that, you don't have election results timely. Also, you have this perception of opaqueness, and this is where it gets scary. You might remember this quote. Um, I'd, li I'd like you to find me 11,780 votes. Now, what if this, the Secretary of State was corrupt and they went, twisted their little mustache and said, hee hee hee, we'll find some votes here, we'll find some votes there. They would not match up with the city, the certified results from each city, and we would know that the results were fudged. And that is getting the attention of the Secretary of State's office, that's getting attention of the legislators. So I'm just going to end with this. The fact that you, with you removed the specific method from the charter, and so that that method is defined at the ordinance level, that was smart. And rather than taking on the House Government Operations Committee, because they removed it for a reason. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Chris, you're next. I was going to talk about process, and I'll start with the process that we're hearing tonight. Uh, I think it's kind of wildly inappropriate to kind of change the rules of engagement uh, at such short notice in between the two forums here. Uh, I had prepared, uh, as I believe others have, a little more substantive comments with the expectation that we would have more than two minutes, and to just suddenly change that, it just it creates an unlevel playing field. But despite that, I just simply say that uh, of the maps that were offered uh, on the board docs for your consideration tonight, uh, I like the version two edit uh, probably the best because I think it, it achieves the, the goal of unifying the King Maple neighborhood. Um, I think many of you got the paperwork uh, when I came in here. Um, the reality is I really would prefer uh, some minor tweaks as one counselor put it last week. Um, the version 25 map that Robert Bristow Johnson had put together I think does a better job of unifying King Maple. But the other concern that I had is that uh, I believe it's in the city ordinance, the central peddling district or the central business district is westernmost boundary is defined as South Union Street. So I was just thinking that, you know, for that reason, maybe extending the border over to South Union would be better and then running it down to uh, South, uh, down to Maple Street. Um, so that's what's in the packet. Um, again, this is Mr. Bristow Johnson's work. You all know who he is. He's submitted a number of maps for consideration, many of which have been vetted by the city. Uh, and his math, I think, has been validated in nearly every uh, occasion. So I would hope that we could have a more substantive consideration tonight and not get hung up on the technicalities of whether or not this particular map has been drawn by the, the city mapping specialist. Um, but. Uh, Long and short of it is, if that's not something the council is willing to consider as an incremental change, uh, I would say that I think the, the version two edit is probably the one that uh, does the best job of balancing all of the statutory considerations uh, along with the community values. And here I am right down to the wire. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm just gonna give a, uh, give a minute or so for anyone who's here in Contois if they wish to speak during the public hearing, you can just raise your hand. Um, and as well to the people that are online, um, if there's anyone else online who would like to speak during the public hearing, that is not the public forum. There will be another opportunity to speak during the public forum. Um, and yes, if you speak to one, you can speak during the other. Um, so I'll just give it a second here. Okay, I'm so glad that I did because we have one more person who'd like to speak. That's uh, Christopher Aaron Felker. I was hoping to have a little bit more time than the two minutes, so I'll tailor these uh, these comments down. I'm going to start with redistricting. I, uh, I appreciate the work that everybody's put in from city council, including the ad hoc committee members who really listened. 
Uh, I attended quite a few of the city's redistricting um, meetings, and the, um, the feedback that I've heard time and time again from all Burlingtonians was, we don't like the gerrymandered look of Ward 8. Great, you guys did a good job, it's fixed. Uh, the second thing, and this was very common, we can't stand the district model. We cannot stand the district model. I see no change in that. Uh, the third thing, uh, members, uh, Burlingtonians were saying they wanted to return to having two counselors per ward. I don't see that. Um, full reunification of the Maple King neighborhood. Uh, we're getting there. Ultimately, uh, with one minute left, I don't like the maps that you put forward, and I'm telling members of the city to please vote against them so that way we can go back to the drawing board, have a more equitable map for all of Burlington for the next 10 years. That being said, I'm going to kick it over to ranked choice voting. Um, this experiment is it's fine. I, I like the theory of how it can work well in our ward elections. I don't like the idea of a centralized vote for exactly the same reasons that Mr. Robert Bristow Johnson brought up. Two things I'd like to highlight. UVM Legislative Research Workshop has already cited that with ranked choice voting, individuals who English is not their first language, if they have a GED or a high school education, they are much less likely to rank votes. That being said, who's this going to really be benefiting? Uh, if voting is intimidating or confusing people, ultimately less people will start to vote, and that is a problem. So on top of that, the, the centralization of the vote would cause people to lose confidence in that, and that is something we should absolutely be avoiding right now. I fully support making voting more accessible for everybody, but I think that we need to make sure that we're weighing the unintended consequences and how that could have a negative outcome on what our total unified goals are. Thanks. Thank you. Do not see anyone else um, online. Do not see anyone else in contours. Going once, going twice. Uh, we will close the public hearing at 6.07. And uh, with our thanks to all who have attended and spoken at these public hearings, your, your input has been very important to us. We will move on to item number three on our agenda, which is an update on the crisis response team. Um, I understand that, uh, um, that Jackie Corbley is joining us and don't know if you're gonna be able to also, um, uh, Catherine, if you could just simply promote Jackie, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to uh, Mayor Weinberger. Great, thank you, President Paul. Um, <clears throat> hopefully we can get uh, Jackie Corbley um, promoted who will um, uh, give the, the bulk of this presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with a couple remarks. I've just done that, I've just done okay, that. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we also have a um, PowerPoint, which um, uh, Catherine, will, Catherine will bring up. But basically, there, this is a simple PowerPoint. The first page is just a, a, a timeline, and then the, the second page shows sort of what's next from here. We just reached, I'm, I'm happy to say tonight, we've reached a, a significant milestone in this effort, which really began um, uh, in, in many ways in April of, of 21 um, in my state of the city, um, we announced uh, that we would attempt to set up a new mental health uh, initiative um, and the council budget in 21 um, did approve $400,000 in funding for this. Um, and, for a, a, and that funding was uh, approved again, as you know, um, in, for a second time in the budget passed in June of 22. The um, stumbling block or a significant obstacle for some time that we've been working on for some time is a desire both for financial and programmatic reasons to have the um, state of Vermont <clears throat> fully um, uh, involved and, and partnered in this effort. And uh, we spent a, a good uh, portion of the last legislative session uh, discussing this with them. And in November, on November, in <clears throat> um, Sorry, in October of this year, following up from those discussions, they released 
a RFP uh, that um, provided the opportunity for um, substantial funding for um, for this uh, uh, <coughs> um, crisis response team. Um, in re when that RFP was posted, at that point we brought on board Jackie Corbley, who um, many of you know worked for the city in the past. She was a major part of our uh, opioid crisis response effort from 2016 through, um, I, I believe, uh, into 2019, 2020. Maybe Jackie can clarify that when she comes on. Um, uh, we, she came, rejoined the city team as a consultant um, uh, or as a, a part-time employee on November 1st, led the effort to submit a grant to the Agency of um, Human Services that was submitted on, on November 14th, and we did re receive the formal notice last Monday um, that the uh, this the state will has committed six hundred sixty seven thousand two hundred fifty two dollars over the next two years, which is basically a, a, a fifty percent sharing of the cost with the city of the anticipated costs of of this program. Um, the state has also been quite engaged in through this uh, period of uh, in giving input on program design and implementation. And um, the person who's really heading up that work for the city is Jackie. And so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jackie to kind of sh share where we go from here um, with this effort. Good evening. I hope that everyone can hear me okay. Well, Jackie, uh, yeah, thank you. Right, great. So um, I think some of you know me, some of you do not know me. My name is Jackie Corbley. I was hired as Mayor Weinberger stated back in November to really um, move this initiative forward. Um, as the mayor stated, we submitted a rather vibrant RFP to the Department of Mental Health uh, back in November and recently as of January 17th found out that we were awarded um, that money to move forward, which I need to say is incredibly exciting. Um, I think the Department of Mental Health is excited about this initiative um, and we are incredibly excited about where this is going to go. Um, I think I first need to state that um, We've really looked at this crisis team. I know that it's being referred by a number of folks as cahoots. Um, we've started to call this the medically enhanced crisis team, crisis response team, and there's a reason for that. Um, um, there are a variety of response teams that exist within the Howard Center, and we wanted to make sure that this team was able to stand out. And it is unique in that there is a medical component to it. And so we wanted to make sure we were really clear about what this team is called. Um, we have received the grant. Uh, we've been awaiting to, to get the formal statement that we had the grant. Um, we, in the short time that I've been in the city, are moving at light speed. And I know that each and every one of you wanted this team, this crisis team, up and running months ago. But I feel that given that we have finally got the award from the state, um, there is a lot of conversations um, and we are doing a fair amount of dialoguing with the Howard Center. Um, we're doing a fair amount of dialoguing with um, a number um, of entities that are gonna be part of this. So I have moved now to the third, uh, the third slide, I think. The, uh, the timeline is pretty self-explanatory. We're in the process right now of developing the MOU and looking at the Howard Center to sign off. I think most people know that they are critical in this initiative. So that MOU is being written and we are looking to get sign off um, ASAP. Uh, we are looking to come up with Howard, uh, a target launch date. And I know that everybody wants this as soon as possible. And um, nobody wants this sooner than those folks that this is going to serve. So we understand time is of the essence. Um, we are developing right now a triage process because as individuals call in, 
we want to make sure, and Howard wants to make sure that the right crisis team is deployed. Um, as many of you know, we have street outreach, we have first call. Um, there are other grants that Howard has gotten um, awarded and we wanna make sure that when this medically enhanced crisis team is deployed, it's meeting the needs of those individuals it's meant to serve. So we are in the process right now of coming up with a triage to ensure that that, is, um, that, that happens in a timely manner. Uh, we also are working on developing uh, a no wrong door approach. The last thing any of us want is for a uh, consumer to call a phone number and find that it's the wrong number. So we are developing a no wrong door approach. Whether you call the city, whether you call Howard, the right team will be deployed in the right way in the most timely fashion. Um, we are really sensitive to having a triage that meets the needs of the individuals that this is meant to serve. Because we all know that when you're in a crisis, the last thing you want is to wait. And so that is something that we are doing. I, I have to say that um, I am incredibly proud of the individuals that are stepping up. Um, this has been a short span of time. I know it seems like a long time since this was decided, but given the implementation, implementation of the RFP to where we are now, we are moving at light speed. And uh, we are working hard and long to get this out the door ASAP. So um, that's what I have um, for you um, at this point. The goal is that I will be coming back to continue to update you, um, but this is where we are now. So to summarize, we put an RFP out the door, we were awarded the RFP, we're getting an MOU and a contract out the door, we're working with our partners, uh, both at the Howard Center and the hospital and other community players. Uh, we're developing a no wrong door approach and we're developing a triage approach. That's a lot of work. That is a lot, but I am hopeful that we are going to get this out the door um, ASAP. Uh, <clears throat> President Paul, the only thing I just add from my conversations uh, with Jackie, just, uh, you know, Obviously, there's, there's seven staff members that are envisioned as being um, part of this team, uh, and the process to, to hire all of them up could, you know, could be lengthy. Um, one of the things being evaluated now is, is there a way to, uh, using uh, existing resources, existing staff, is there any way that that, that timeline can be short-circuited because uh, of, of, you know, the desire to get this uh, started as soon as possible. So that's one of the things, you know, again, it's been just a week since the, the formal notice of the award. Um, uh, that's one of the, the strategies that's being evaluated and that we would have more to uh, update on uh, next, you know, next, uh, at the next uh, juncture. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mayor Weinberger, and thanks, Jackie. Uh, if anybody can balance all of these things and get it done in record time, it's you, Jackie. Uh, so thanks so much for being here and your work on this. Um, are there counselors who have questions or comments either to Jackie or uh, or to the mayor? Uh, Councilor Carpenter. Thanks. Um, and this may just be my own interest. Um, I'm hopeful that there, those of us who are following it, there's so much detail, and I know you're working in light speed to get it done, but it would be great to have a a fuller update as you proceed, just to, to understand it so we can explain it to the community. And I've just got a lot of questions like with, how do you operate something like this 24 seven since we don't know when a crisis will arise and they could arise at all varied times of day and night. Um, so I, I don't think you need to answer any of this now. I'm just suggesting that I think there's some of us who really would like to follow the details or it doesn't even need to necessarily be in person, but in writing so we can answer some of those questions and kind of walk us through what happens when you call. I mean, tell us the protocols, not specifically, but you know, walk us through what is, what is this gonna look like? And thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Councillor Carpenter. Um, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that or if there was anything you felt you could add, either of you. Um, I think that obviously, uh, as this gets more to the finish line and it gets ready to be um, put out into the community, 
before that happens, absolutely want each and every one of you to know the protocol and what happens from the minute you pick up the phone and how do you end up being deployed? Which team gets deployed? How did we come to that decision? What's the time frame? What are the hours that this team will be operational? What's the vision? Absolutely, those are all things that um, I think would be important to address as we work out more of this, more of this plan in Minutia. Great, thanks very much. Um, we'll go to Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul, and thank you, Mayor Weinberger and Jackie, for this update. It's uh, encouraging to hear that we are uh, moving uh, more quickly now than we have been in uh, a number of months to, to get this crisis response team operational. Um, I think it's, you know, we've been having this conversation uh, since before it was in the State of the City address, and uh, I know there are a number of members of the community, uh, myself included, who are very um, uh, eager to, to see this uh, team operational. So uh, I appreciate the work that you're putting in, Jackie, to make that a reality for us um, at, at a, a very um, rapid pace. Um, and. I just want to echo what Councillor Carpenter said. Uh, I've heard from a number of constituents who uh, are also very eager to have someone else that they can call uh, if they notice that someone's experiencing mental health crisis or um, uh, struggling with uh, substance use disorder. So um, to the extent that we can make clear that uh, what exactly uh, the no wrong door approach means, uh, I think for not just the council, but um, the broader public, I think that will be important as well. So I look forward to a, a, a big public education campaign around that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McGee. Uh, are there any other councillors that uh, wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, uh, no other questions or comments, we'll close out this item. Thanks so much, Jackie, for being here and to the mayor for this, sharing this good news with us. Uh, we'll look forward to the next steps um, in the, hopefully in the very short, I would say months to come, but I don't want to do that. I wanna say days to come and hopefully soon. Um, the time is now uh, 6.21, uh, which means we are way ahead of, uh, time for the public forum and anything that's a deliberative item. So we will move on to um, the next item that we can, which would be item number five, climate emergency reports. Is there any counselor or the administration who wishes to offer a climate emergency report? Seeing, oh. Uh, great, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, th thanks, President Paul. I just, um, it, for the climate uh, emergency uh, report, I just um, want to share here what we shared with the public um, <clears throat> in a press conference uh, uh, two weeks ago, which is that the Burlington Electric Department has uh, announced their 2023 uh, in, uh, <clears throat> green incentives for a whole range of electrically um, powered products that will help Burlingtonians move away from fossil fuels and towards electrified equipment. Um, what was different about this year's uh, event, we, we've done this for a number of years now and there has been a huge increase in the adoption of cold climate heat pumps and electric vehicles in the time the BD has been offering these incentives which are some of the most generous local incentives anywhere in the country. Um, what's different now and what I hope really kind of breaks through and Burlingtonians here is that um, there has never been a better time to consider electric technology than right, not, right now. And uh, this may be a, a somewhat brief window um, in, in this way that uh, right now people, Burlingtonians who are considering an electric vehicle uh, uh, can layer both local incentives with state incentives and federal incentives to make a purchase or a lease. Um, at the press conference, we gave the example of a Burlingtonian looking uh, with moderate income looking to purchase a Chevy Bolt, a $31,000 car. 
um, that buyer right now could be eligible for $3,000 in local incentives, $4,000 in state incentives, and then $7,500 in federal incentives. Um, <clears throat> which would, you know, you add all that up and it's, it, it reduces the cost of the, the car by, by half. The reason why we're saying that this may not last um, forever, um, you know, there will be incentives offered by the federal government for a significant length of time. It's a 10-year bill. So these incentives are not going to go away. But there are um, new rules being written that may make... Uh, restrict choices and make, um, depending on what car a Burlingtonian is interested in buying, there may be less generous federal subsidies available some months uh, down the road. So if this is something you've been considering, uh, this is the way we're going to get to net zero uh, as a community, is if, if Burlingtonians and business owners make this change, now's the time to take a look. A lot more information on the, on the BED website. Thank you, President Paul. Great. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. We'll go to Councillor Bergman. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, last meeting, we adopted uh, on the consent agenda, agenda unanimously the uh, funding of mass transit resolution. I think it's really important. That resolution was sent to our entire delegation, both House and Senate. I had the opportunity to speak to Speaker Kowinski um, this past week, and she expressed um, that there was support for transit funding in the House and that they were going to, uh, to be working on this. Uh, it's my experience that things don't happen in that House without people pushing. It is why we passed the, um, the resolution and called for this Council and our administration to be active in that. So I guess that following up on that conversation that I had with the speaker who happens to be my um, representative. Um, I'm hoping that each and every member of this uh, council will reach out to your representatives and um, state senators and I also hope that the administration will um, follow this up. I know that that is part that funding is part of the mayor's uh, Vermont mayor's um, agenda um, it is now, I believe, by the passage of that resolution, part of the city's legislative agenda, and it is, it, it's critically important. There are a lot of, there's a lot of competition. All you have to do is listen to Vermont Public Radio, as opposed to maybe television right now, to, uh, to hear the, um, the competition that's out there for funding. Um, interestingly enough, the funding study that the Regional Planning Commission did has um, funding sources that are not being discussed in the media now. That, I'm not sure that, that they're not being discussed in the legislature for other things. But what that says to me is that there are some other um, sources of funding that would not be in competition. There is obviously a question as it relates to the governor's um, commitment to raise public funds, uh, his so-called affordability um, agenda. It, it sort of smacks up against that, which is why we really need to have good, caring people who care about the public fisc and about the affordability of our residents uh, to be engaged in this. And I just want to continue to double down on my advocacy and my um, strong um, request that the administration in particular take the lead in helping us do this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for that update, Councillor Bergman. Are there any other councillors who have, would like to offer a climate emergency report? Uh, oh, Councillor Councilor Travers. Just briefly, President Paul, I was excited to see that the uh, parking Reform Network uh, released a list of a number of communities that have been added to the list nationwide uh, of cities with no parking mandates. So San Jose, California, Anchorage, Alaska, Gainesville, Florida, uh, Bend, Oregon, Corvallis, Oregon, Tigard, Oregon, and Burlington, Vermont, uh, now on the list of cities with no parking mandates. Um, the Parking Reform Network, parkingreform.org, great resource where Folks can see information on 200 plus communities around the country that have taken a similar move and was excited to see uh, Burlington highlighted on, on the map. Thank you. Thanks very much. 
Uh, seeing no other counselors in the queue, we'll go uh, to items 9, 10, 11, um, 9, 10, and 11 at the end of our agenda. And then if we have time, we'll go back to the local control commission meeting, which we can do prior to the public forum. So uh, that leaves us with item number eight, which is committee reports. Are there counselors who wish to offer a committee report? Councillor Barlow, to be followed by Councillor Hightower, McGee, and Bergman. No, I'm, my apologies. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, President Paul. <clears throat> the um, Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee will be meeting tomorrow, January 24th, um, and we'll be meeting at 645 Pine Street, and on our agenda are, uh, in, we're getting an update on the South End Transit Oriented Development and Multimodal Center Planning, excuse me. Um, we're getting an update from CarShare Vermont on their operations, and uh, we'll be discussing future agenda items and, and meeting planning. Thank you. Great, and what time is that at? Oh, sorry, it's at 5 p.m. Great. Uh, so we'll go to Councilor McGee and then Bergman. Thank you, President Paul. The Public Safety Committee met uh, last Wednesday to discuss uh, moving forward with some of the CNA recommendations. Uh, we have uh, discussed a number of the department directives, which uh, many of the highest priority CNA recommendations involved edits to department directives. Um, BPD staff have been working very hard to uh, do work on those and uh, as well as the com police commission. Uh, staff are working uh, through the first quarter to have those department directives, uh, those amendments to the police commission for review, uh, not just by the commission, but uh, for review and comment from the public as well. So um, I think the hope is to have uh, the first uh, revisions to the police commission in February uh, for their February meeting and I would encourage folks to keep an eye out for that and uh, we'll do my best to advertise those as well so and hopefully our minutes will be posted uh, in the days to come thank you thanks Councillor McGee we'll go to Councillor Bergman um, believe it or not the Charter Change Committee um, just met and one might say, well, I, why? Since we've got three charter changes on there, we're done with the deadlines are passed. But uh, there are um, a few items that are still in the, in the, um, the committee's uh, jurisdiction and uh, review. Um, and we are gonna be, so we listed them and we'll start uh, some, uh, some research and uh, have some um, substantive discussion in our next meeting, which will be in March, because after all, there's no rush since uh, charter changes are generally done in um, March. The, the first is counselor compensation. This is not a new issue. It's an issue that you know um, speaks to the openness and availability of uh, our positions here to, uh, to a wider um, public. It is part of the democracy um, reforms that some of which are on the the um, the town meeting uh, ballot this time. And so w there's a, there's a bit of work that needs to be done in terms of the research, the the pays that are out there in uh, in Vermont and in comparable areas, um, what the impacts will be. So that that's a conversation that we're looking to have. Um, redistricting, as I called it last week, was, is a swamp. And one of the, the problems is that it's a charter change. And there has been a proposal to not remove the voters from the decision, but to actually enable the voters to approve without then going to the legislature for the approval um, of um, our uh, electoral districts in the city. Um, it's an idea that we thought about bringing in conjunction with this redistricting. I think that we were smart in not doing it. It's complicated and confusing enough as we have it right now. 
but that is still on our item and it, uh, in our committee, and we're looking, I think, to discuss this here in, in March um, so that you can get um, a little bit more detail and we can uh, get feedback. And the last one is a relatively new item that also will need a, a lot of um, research and discussion, and that is participatory budgeting, which is a, an idea that has been floated out in a number of campaigns over the last uh, few years in a lot of ways. Many years ago, the NPAs had bigger pots of money that they dispensed, and that was participatory budgeting. And there are m many municipalities in the, uh, in the world that, um, that do this. Porto Alegre in Brazil was probably the most famous um, example, but New York City also has a piece of it. So that is another item that we will begin the, the process of discussing, and that we'll obviously need to have fine conversations with our fine CAO about this. But um, at the end of the day, I think that people in America, including Burlington, want greater say and control and democracy um, over their lives and their governments and the monies that they spend. And this is a, uh, a potential way that we can make that happen. So more to come on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Councilor Bergman. We'll go to Councilor Travers. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Brandt's first meeting with the Ordinance Committee was a joint meeting with the Planning Commission uh, where we reviewed proposed amendments to our inclusionary zoning ordinance uh, to allow greater flexibility around bedroom, bedroom mix and the size of, of um, excuse me, affordable housing units. Uh, the Planning Commission, I know, is taking that back up on its own at its meeting tomorrow, and then the Ordinance Committee and Planning Commission will be having at least one or two additional joint meetings for the purpose of our reviewing that specific issue. Great, thanks for that update. Uh, seeing no other committee reports, we'll move on to item nine, which is City Council, General City Affairs. Are there councilors who wish to offer comments on General City Affairs? Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, I just wanted to note quickly that I will be doing a constituent coffee hour at Nunyans uh, from 8.30 to 9.30 this coming Friday, January 27th, and uh, welcome folks to attend that. Great, thank you. Any others? Uh, seeing none, that will bring us to item number 10, which is Council President Updates. The only update that I have is that on February 6th, we are going to have a presentation from the Howard Outreach Team to inform us about their work and their insight into our community's challenges and successes on the street. Um, so more to come on that. Not sure exactly what time, but that will hopefully be on our agenda for the 6th of February. Um, that will bring us to item number 11, which is updates from the mayor. Mayor Weinberger, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I, I don't think I have anything further to share at this at this time. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, of course, the time that we we have more than enough time is the time that we have seems to have a little have less to say. Um, that means that we can go to um, uh, we can go to the consent of uh, the. Uh, uh, Local Control um, Committee, or Local Control Commission. So I'm gonna get that meeting up and then we can go through that agenda. Okay, so the uh, so we'll we'll recess the uh, city council meeting at six forty and call to order the uh, local control commission meeting at the same time. Um, the first item on the agenda is item one point oh one, 
which is a motion to adopt the agenda. Um, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Traver, seconded by uh, Com uh, Commissioner Hightower. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. We have our agenda. And we have only one item on our deliberative agenda. That is um, item 2.01, a second class liquor license application for Campus Kitchen 273 Colchester Avenue. Uh, Commissioner Travers. Move to approve the 2022-2023 second class liquor license application for Campus Kitchen 273 Colchester Avenue with all standard conditions. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Travers. Uh, seconded by uh, Commissioner Hightower. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is made by Commissioner Travers, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. And with no other business on the agenda and seeing no objection, we'll adjourn the local control commission meeting at uh, 641. Um, I don't believe that we can go to the council with mayor presiding and I don't think that there is, don't think that there is anything more that we can do until public forum, which will start at 730. So with that, we will recess the, oh, actually we, we, we adjourned the local control commission meeting. We will now, uh, we will now go back to the city council meeting at 6:41, um, and with that, and no other business that we can that we can conduct until we get to public forum, we will recess the council meeting until 7:30, which means we can move on to public forum. Thank you all for your patience. We do have a couple of people that wish to speak in the public forum. Um, and before we start, just a couple of pieces of information. If you're speaking in person, the table in front of us has three lights. A uh, green light will shine when you start speaking. A second, uh, the yellow light will shine when you have 30 seconds left. And then a red light will shine when your time is up. Um, and all we ask is that you try to wrap up your comments um, or wrap up your comments when the light and the sound indicate that your time is up so that we all give the same amount of time to everyone. Um, we have a hybrid system for public forum. So if you wish to speak in person, there are forms that look like this that are right in the corner of the room. You can fill one out and then uh, give it to the clerk and um, they will give it to me. Um, and then we'll call on you in the order of Burlington residents will go first and then we will go to Burlington residents online. If you wish to speak via Zoom, uh, you can do so. Um, and I actually need to get on Zoom. You need, um, you can, uh, you can, you can do it in two ways. The, the easiest way is to go to burlingtonvt.gov forward slash city council forward slash public forum and a form will come up. Uh, if you complete the form, your answers will come into a spreadsheet that's in front of me, and then I'll be able to call on you. Um, if you aren't able to access the form and just want to use the raise your hand raise hand function, I'll recognize you as well. Um, so the way we do this is Burlington residents in Contois will have first priority. Uh, Burlington residents online will have second, and then we will go back to Contois for non-Burlington residents and then to non-Burlington residents online. And our only request is that it's easier for us to listen if you uh, direct your comments to me as the chair and not to anyone else at this table. Um, please do not personalize your comments. Um, and uh, there are a number of people, we actually had them at the last council meeting, a number of people who actually bring their children and watch this, um, watch council meetings with their kids and um, that's part of their civic commitment to civic engagement. It is helpful if you keep that in mind and use respectful language. Um, I need to get on to Zoom so that I can be able to call on people. So give me a, one moment here.
Okay, you should see me, Catherine. Thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, there are two people who wish to speak from uh, speak during public forum who are in Contois. Um, the first is Aspirin Overy, and the next is Todd Lacroix. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to talk. I'm here to comment on three issues. Uh, first off, quickly, uh, issue 6.12 of rezoning. I, as a UVM student, I'm sure there is a lot of pressure on you guys from the UVM administration to allow this rezoning. And I sincerely hope you guys don't without, without, provide, without some memorandum of understanding that UVM caps enrollment, because otherwise, the way UVM mistreats its students will not, will continue, and through overcrowding. And no problems will be solved in the long run. Uh, second off, uh, I want to talk Oh, sorry. The next thing I want to talk about was issue 3.01 uh, with the mayor on the with the mayor presiding agenda, and so I just wanted to address some lies that were being spread about Lee Morgan. Uh, there are lies and accusations that Lee Morgan is some sort of lead organizer for the community for the community oversight board or Proposition Zero. I am I am an organizer for community for the Community Oversight Board and Proposition Zero. This is just not true. I added, I'm sure Lee is in support, and I hope that Lee is in, in the cause or, or whatever people would like to say, but I added Lee at 8.30 p.m. on Tuesday, last Tuesday. This is, Lee is not some central organizer, and, it's, and I added Lee to a group chat. That's Lee's entire capacity. And it's kind of disgusting that there are lies like this being spread by certain city councilors about Lee, about Lee Morgan. It's, yeah, I sincerely hope the city council, I also can prove this, I sincerely hope the city council repudiates these lies and, not, and appoints them to the, board, to the Parks and Rec Commission. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Todd LaCroix, and then we'll go to Burlington residents um, online. Welcome, Todd. Good evening. <coughs> Hello. I'm here to bother you again with a little more inconvenient truth. Artificial intelligence. I keep hearing all about it. Well, you know what I see everywhere I look? Artificial insanity and stupidity instead. All I see you guys doing is running circles around the truth and calling it progress ruining your children's future, and then getting mad at them for complaining that you're denying them solutions. You see, here we are living in a culture where our children's number one cause of death is bullets. And you people are just so distracted by causing another war in another country. You have all this money for weapons, but no money for the children. No money for the starving, homeless people in America, but you got all this money to blow up Russians and support Nazis in another country. And you don't even want to have the conversation after the disaster of the last 20 years of Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya about how insane it is. Artificial insanity is what you guys are fucking doing. Excuse me. Artificial insanity, because I don't see intelligence even amongst the people building AI. So where is that taking us? And you guys are about to weaponize all these things and call it progress when you don't have any solutions. My whole life, I have seen people promising solutions while at the same time working against them. And our children's number one cause of death is bullets. And all you want to do is spread more weapons around the world instead of create solutions that are real. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, we'll go to uh, 
people who had requested that Burlington residents who had asked to speak that are uh, joining us via Zoom. Uh, the first is Keith Pillsbury. And Keith, I have found you and uh, enabled your microphone. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair uh, Chairman Paul. Can you hear me okay? I can hear, we can hear you great. Thank you. I'm really coming to just to uh, make sure that we, we as a uh, street right a wrong that we made 10 years ago by not speaking up. 10 years ago, we talked about wanting to be in a different ward than, than we were currently being assigned to. And we didn't say anything. We figured that somebody would, out, would uh, do it for us. And, and, and um, as I said to some of my neighbors this weekend, we need to right the wrong. And some that we made 10 years ago and somebody said, one of my neighbors said, well, we, the wrong that was made 50 years ago, many of us on our street have been here for 30 to 50 years. We are a very, we're a small street. We are totally surrounded by institutional space that is not uh, residential. And we would like to be close to our neighbors on, New, on Robinson Parkway in and in Ward 6. We would appreciate your consideration that we become part of a neighborhood that is more like our neighborhood. Uh, we, um, we, we would like to be part of Ward 6. And I appreciate all the time and effort you're putting into this. And um, I hope that that will become true in the end. Thank you very much, Chairman Paul. Thanks so much, Keith. Uh, our next speaker who wanted to join us online is Sharon Busher. And Sharon, I have found you and enabled your microphone. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, good evening. Um, I wanted to talk about council rules and the item was public forum. It's kind of ironic since you had this hiatus to deal with the public forum, but, um, and I understand really the the need to balance how you move through your agenda efficiently and get your job done and also accommodate the public and give them some idea when they will be able to address the council. My only comment is that as I read it, um, you're proposing a one and a half hour time between six and 7.30. And my concern is that six o'clock, although for all of you might seem late in the day, I think for a lot of people that worked, I, I used to work at the hospital, um, that, that's tight. Um, and I know people, I mean, I, I now zoom in, but um, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I was working at the hospital. I couldn't, I couldn't work in emergency you know, situations and zoom in. So I'm hoping that maybe as you look at this, you might tighten that window to 6.30 to 7.30, giving the public an hour in which they know that that's when you'll open the public forum. Um, and uh, that tightens it. And I think it gives a little more play for the people who are working during the day to actually attend. Uh, if they want to in person. Um, I really think the idea is to get the governing done, but also to include the public in the process. And I'm hoping you um, can see the need to balance both. Thank you so much. Thank you for the suggestion, uh, Sharon. Um, we will, there is one more person who wished to speak online and that is Maddie Posig. Maddie, I have found you and uh, you should be able to speak now. Uh, thank you, President. Oh my God, sorry. <laughs> Maddie, <laughs> my apologies, I disconnected you. I, oh. think you can, I think you can speak now, please start, <laughs> so my apologies, please start again. Okay, you can hear me, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, St I'll start again. My name is Maddie Posig and I live in Ward 8 on Hungerford Terrace. I've been anxiously awaiting for redistricting ever since Ward 8 was created 10 years ago as a result of the information gathered by the ad hoc committee. It is my understanding that fixing Ward 8 was a high priority. How to fairly distribute the on-campus student population was also a high priority. The map that the city council adopted in December 
most fairly distributes the on-campus students between wards one, six, and eight. In addition, that map moved several blocks of long-term residents that were adjacent to Ward 8 into Ward 8. These moves achieved the goal of creating a Ward 8 that was more fairly balanced demographically. With the map that you adopted in December, no ward had more than 50% population of on-campus students. With the introduction of the maps being presented tonight, the on-campus student population in Ward 8 is double the population in Ward 1. These maps do not achieve the goal of creating a better Ward 8. Last week, several speakers objected to the adopted map, stating it would harm Ward 1. These new maps harm Ward 8, a war that has faced challenges since its, since its inception 10 years ago. I really don't understand how moving a few blocks from Ward 1 into Ward 8 harms Ward 1. I am asking you to not repeat the mistake tonight that was made 10 years ago, and please vote for the map that you already approved. It is the fairest compromise for all eight wards. And again, thank you for all your hard work on this difficult process. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, there are no other people who have signed up to speak during the public forum. I'm just gonna check one more time online. Uh, so with that, we will close the public forum at 7.45. Um, we have already completed the local control commission um, and uh, we have one other meeting. Um, before we get to that, um, we can just, uh, we can move to adopt the consent agenda. So this is item number six. Is there a motion to, um, uh, on the consent agenda to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions, actions as indicated. So moved. Uh, thank you, Councilor McGee. A seconded by uh, Councilor Carpenter. All those in favor of the motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, we have our consent agenda. Before we get to our deliberative agenda, there is one more um, meeting that we do have to uh, address, and that is the uh, city council with mayor presiding. Uh, the mayor presides, interestingly enough, the mayor presides over the city council with mayor presiding. So I will hand the floor to uh, Mayor Weinberger, and we will re we will uh, we will recess the council meeting at 7:46 to do so. Um, thank you, President Paul. Um, I will call into order the City Council of Mayor presiding at 747 and I'm gonna call a short five minute recess. Okay, I'm gonna call the board, uh, the City Council of Mayor presiding back to order at 7.53 p.m. And First item on the agenda is the adoption of agenda of the agenda. Could I have a motion regarding it? Second. Any discussion of the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item number two is a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the action indicated. Um, uh, can I have a uh, motion um, regarding the consent agenda? Uh, motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you, President Paul. Is there a second? Second by Councilor Brandt. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. This brings us to 3.01, which is a Parks and Recreation Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2023. And um, the floor is open for nominations. <clears throat> Councilor Jan. Thank you, Ms. Uh, 
Mr. Mayor, I would like to nominate Lee Morgan. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Are there any additional nominations? Um, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I nominate Robert Etter. Are there any additional nominations? Councillor Travers. Nominate Charlie Glisserman. <coughs> Um, th thank you, uh, Councillor Travers. Um, are there any additional nominations? Uh, thank you. I would nominate and I'm happy to nominate Joel Banner Baird for this position. Thank you, President Potter. Are there any additional nominations? Okay, seeing none, we have um, Councilor Freeman. Uh, so, sorry, before we talk about the process here, um, are there any of the nominate, nominees uh, in the room that would like to speak to the um, <clears throat> City Council with Mayor presiding? Uh, welcome. Folks, let me just get to my page here. My name is Lee Morgan. Um, I am in Ward 7, and I wanted to come tonight to address um, some concerns that it has come to my attention that were raised. And I'm going to be up front, I'm going to be emotional. Um, Y'all are going to get to see me cry because a lot of these concerns have. Uh, hurt me deeply, um, but I uh, respect you all enough to, if there's a concern, I would like to address it. Um, okay, let me see my notes. So um, I think one, one of the concerns that has come up is my uh, ability to work in collaboration with folks, um, especially against party lines. Um, and, you know, uh, the ability to work in collaboration is one of my core values. Um, and un unfortunately, it has um, something that has come at a personal cost. I feel like I have a really good track record in Burlington for collaboration. Um, during one of my most passionate times in the city council, which I, I will come back to, I reached out um, to the mayor in collaboration in an effort to reach a peaceful resolution with Sears Lane at the 11th hour. I stayed here till like a 1.30 meeting and had a word with the mayor in an effort of reaching across the aisle. That has come at a personal cost as you know, not everyone's a fan of the mayor or people who reach out to him. And I lost some friends because of that effort. I have also worked with Chief Murad in a spirit of collaboration. He was also someone I went to in a matter that I will also that I will also touch back on because it is of concern of a legal matter I had. And I reached out to the chief for his guidance. Because regardless of some things we disagree on, there are parts of the chief that I quite like. And that's not a popular statement. And again, that came at a personal cost. And I have lost friends and support due to my spirit of collaboration with Chief Murad. I also am very dedicated 
to collective liberation and the BIPOC community. That also has come at a personal cost. And I'm not gonna go into detail. Let's see, where do my notes go? I have arrows going everywhere. So, you know, I think a, a very valid concern is, I don't know if it was a year and a half ago, it was over a year ago, I had an outburst at a meeting during a very passionate vote about Sears Lane. Um, I think that is, anyone who has a concern about my ability to work with others over that, I think that's valid and I don't really wanna, I'm not gonna like justify it. Given the chance, I would handle that differently. Um, I will point out that I've kind of taken that, you know, I, I've kind of joked with, with, with some counselors, I've discussed that, that thing that I've, at the very least, I've now set myself a very public benchmark for the type of like um, conduct I don't want to go back to and I've stuck to that. You know, in my life, I've, I've found that the best way to make amends is to not do something again and I haven't. Um, that, and I, I don't think I've had an outburst like that even before that time, but that was a one-time thing for me and since then I've, I've not done that. I've made some very conscious changes to how I carry myself in meetings and outside of meetings. Um, and I'm you know, really proud of myself for that. But yeah, that is a valid concern for sure. Um, let's see, as, as Aspen had, had mentioned, I, you know, I, was, I was actually really shocked to hear the concern that I'm, I'm a key organizer with the Community Control Board. I'm, I'm not an organizer at all. Um, I know some of the people, I support the measure, and maybe that's what was confusing is I spoke in support of that at the public hearing, but um, I think Aspen liked what I had to say, and I sat down near them after, and they tapped me on the shoulder and asked if they could add me to the group chat. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, you might even be able to see it on the, on the footage from Town Meeting TV of when I plugged my number into their phone, but that's, you know, that was Tuesday. Um, I'm not an organizer with them at all, much less a, a key organizer. But, you know, honestly, I don't understand if I was an organizer with them, I don't understand why that is a concern. Um, I, I, I'm, and I'm kind of only speaking to it, I'm, I'm really only addressing it because I don't understand how that was constructed. Um, and I, I guess I, I would ask you folks, whoever like communicated that to you, I mean, was that just a mistake? Was that an intentional misinformation? I, I guess I would just ask you to examine that because I don't understand how that could have come about. Um, uh, there was a concern that my motivations to getting on the Parks and Rec Commission is based around um, like a, a hidden agenda or a plan to make um, the parks a place for houseless people to live. Um, which, which again kind of made me laugh because clearly whoever has that theory doesn't know me at all. Um, a lot of you do know, because I'm very open about it, that I used to be houseless. I used to have to camp on public lands. And I can tell you, as someone who used to have to camp on public lands, it is not a good solution. And it is never a solution that I would, you know, like push or advocate for, for a solution to our, our housing crisis in Burlington, you Lee, know. Lee, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you for just a moment. We typically, we don't have a formal two minute limit on these, but typically the, the statements by candidates uh, are around that. And so if yeah. you could wrap up quickly, that'd be helpful. Can I have, I can, I can probably do this in like a minute and a half, is that? Sure, go for another minute. It's just, I'm sorry, it's, there's been so many concerns brought to me, so I wanna make sure I address them. Um, but yeah, that's not my agenda. As someone who's camped on public lands, I wouldn't advocate for that for somebody. Um, I think to me the most disturbing one was a concern about a criminal charge I have where I was working on a documentary investigating the disappearance of a black Vermonter and the lack of an investigation. As part of that, I was targeted in an abuse of power by a police department and a state's attorney. I was exonerated, the case was dismissed. It didn't even make it to trial because I was protected under the First Amendment right and the freedom of press. 
So I'm like really hurt that that's brought up as a negative. Um, and I'll just close with, you know, I think the timing of this was so frustrating for me because I'm currently working on mediating an issue in collaboration across party lines to diffuse a conflict before it escalates. And while I was getting calls about concerns that were being raised, I am putting in a lot of effort to de-escalate a situation across party lines, which some of you know because you're helping to advise me in it. So the irony for me is very difficult, but, um, and I'm, I'm sad that I didn't get more time to talk to you about parks, that I'm very passionate. I have a lot of professional experience in stewardship. I have a lot of passion for parks. And I would be more than honored to serve Burlington in a spirit of uh, community and collaboration, even with people who may be under a misunderstanding. I'm totally happy to move forward and put this behind us. So thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for the extra time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Is there, are there any other nominees that would like to come speak to the, the city council mayor presiding? Come on up, Joel. Hello. Um, I'm just basically just introducing myself to some of you uh, who don't know me and some of you who do. Uh, hello again to those who do. My uh, opinions are pretty much um, in the public record as a journalist um, more than a decade of basically listening to many different points of view and trying to balance them to improve a discussion. And um, so that's, that's devoid of any uh, palace intrigue, I'm sorry to say, but that's what you see is what you get here. Um, also, um, I am a, an amateur arborist and an amateur gardener um, and uh, an amateur athlete. So uh, here's to parks and I hope you, uh, you're satisfied with whomever you vote into the position. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. <clears throat> are there any other nominees who are here and would like to speak to the city council mayor presiding? I'm not seeing, uh, I think Catherine's checking to make sure that none of them are online and we don't think so. So um, now let's, uh, <clears throat> to go through the process. So um, I think typically we've, we've done the votes in the order that people were nominated. Um, uh, there will be, uh, Councilor Freeman is voting um, remotely, I believe. Can you confirm that, Councilor F Freeman, and turn on your camera? Yes, I'm here. I'm voting. Okay. Um, I believe, it, is it our rule that cameras be on? I mean, I, I, I don't feel that well, Mayor, so, I mean, I could put my camera on, but I'm literally, like, in a hoodie and just feel disgusting, but if you okay. feel that the public really would benefit from seeing me at this moment. All right, okay. I can I, certainly I turn it to, on, but fair I'm just warning you, I, I'm not, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. So okay. I apologize Understood, for my Councilor Freeman. In, I, informal fair enough. presence. You, go ahead, please turn the, you, I apologize. I was just trying to follow what I believed our rules to be. Um, go ahead. Um, please don't feel obliged to keep it on, Councilor Freeman. So the, um, we have, I think, 12 councilors voting, is that right? One, two, with the, with the mayor, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So as soon as someone gets to seven votes, we will have a nominee. So we'll, we will have votes in the order of the nominations. So the first um, vote, uh, please raise your hand if you are supporting Lee Morgan. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, and the uh, that is a majority of the body. Uh, congratulations, Lee. Uh, thank you for um, your interest uh, and good luck with your service on the on the parks uh, <coughs> commission. And I do want to thank uh, Joel and the numerous other people who voted. This is uh, one of the more competitive seats we've had in 
um, some time, and I would encourage people who are not successful this time to uh, consider applying again. We frequently, many of our longstanding and uh, much appreciated commissioners um, were not successful on their first application. Um, with that, uh, I believe the business of the City Council with Mayor presiding is complete, and I will turn the microphone back to you, uh, President Paul, uh, after adjourning at 8, 10 p.m. Great. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. So we'll reconvene the City Council at 8, 10. Um, we have done all of the work that we can. Um, with the exception of our deliberative agenda. So there are six items on our deliberative agenda. Um, we do, we have posted time limits for each item and which we agree to by approving our agenda and we'll do our best to keep to those limits. Um, the first item is item 7.01, which is an update on redistricting maps per city council action on January 17th um, last week. And just to recap for our community members who may have missed the first public hearing, at the public hearing last week, the council did make two requests of the independent mapping specialist. The first was to review and analyze the map um, that was um, known as eight wards V27. And a second request um, was to uh, come up with a map uh, that joined the Maple King neighborhood into one ward and incorporated Brooks Avenue on both sides of the street um, into Ward 1. Um, Director Megan Tuttle is here. Um, she and uh, Sarah Morgan worked on the maps, uh, the population totals, and there is a memo that's posted to board docs. Um, all were done on Friday evening. And uh, for this item, I'll go to Director Tuttle if you can give us a brief presentation on the information. Um, and then we'll go uh, open it up to the council. Uh, Director Tuttle, thank you for being here. You're welcome, thank you. Um, so I think that, I hope that the memo helped summarize the three different maps that you have available to you in your packet in response to your motions from last week. I'm happy to put them up on the screen if it would be helpful, but um, wanted to just start with an acknowledgement. I, I think for those of you that know me know that I'm usually very intentional and careful with my words and the memo that was posted on Friday night um, left a little bit to be desired. So I wanna share a little bit more with you um, just about kind of the process for us actually bringing forward maps in response to your requests from last week. Uh, so the first map as um, counselor, as President Paul indicated was our validation of the map eight wards V27. So I'll just refer to that as V27 from here out. Um, we did look at the individual ward uh, population counts and student counts for each of them and largely came to the same conclusion that the members of the public did with regard to the numbers for that map. The piece of information for our purposes in order to complete this work for you that was missing from that, that work that had been completed by members of the public and, and from your vote was an indication on how you preferred the wards to be paired um, in that map. So I did wanna speak to that just briefly to share information about kind of our process and um, some of the considerations we made in preparing that aspect of this work for you. Um, the first is just to give you a little bit of background on the boring stuff about the kind of technical details of how we put this together. Um, we haven't talked about this a whole lot in the process of preparing these maps, but in addition to ensuring that the individual wards meet the overall 10% deviation, we also just need to confirm that the districts do as well. Um, this is easier to do because they're bigger, and so that gives us more flexibility in terms of meeting an overall deviation. Um, but in order for us to actually validate um, what the numbers are for those deviations, we needed to know how to pair the actual wards together into districts. Um, similarly, in order to produce charter language for you so that you could potentially consider voting on any of these maps tonight, we needed to know how to pair those wards into districts. Um, this may seem like a, a really silly nuance, but the way that our charter language is written is that it actually describes the outer boundaries of a district and then describes how that's divided into two wards instead of describing the outer boundary of every ward and then pairing them. So um, that sounds really nuancy, but essentially that means that it has big implications for how we actually write the charter language for your consideration. Um, so we needed to know how to pair these words together 
in order to meet both of the kind of technical aspects of this map making process for your consideration tonight. Um, so that brought us to then how we approached that work. Um, I think as you all know from looking at this map that V27's proposed approach to Ward 8 is very different from our current Ward 8. Um, it's made up of portions of Wards 1, 3, 5, 6, and 8 to comprise that proposed 8. And so it therefore affects portions of the East, Central, and South districts. Um, due to the extent of that change and the fact that Ward 8's proposed boundaries don't follow the recent history of other wards, um, we actually found uh, the most recent time we had similar wards shaped like that were actually in 1865. Um, uh, we weren't sure, the intent of the pairing of the wards into districts wasn't clear to us just from a geographic perspective. Um, so we had to look at some of the other factors that you all have talked about through this process. Things like um, maintaining respect for historic neighborhood boundaries, uh, considering impact on certain communities of interest, uh, et cetera. So that is where we went next in terms of thinking about how to make a recommendation to you about this pairing. Because we know that the King Maple neighborhood was an area of concern in why these maps came back to us at this stage in the process, we were really focused on how the ward district pairing might impact the King Maple neighborhood and its outcome. Um, the, the good thing about the proposed Ward 8 is that it does bring all of the King Maple neighborhood into a single ward with Ward 8. Um, but because this ward spans all the way from the waterfront to campus, the impact of which district it was paired with was significant. Um, if we paired that ward with Ward 1, this meant that the King Maple neighborhood would be part of a district that spanned all the way from Bobbin Mill to the Winooski Bridge. It would be a very big district. Um, and we were not sure if that was the intent of the council for the outcome of that neighborhood's pairing. By, by recommending pairing wards three and eight together, we know that the King Maple neighborhood maintains a district pairing with other geographically proximate neighborhoods, such as the downtown and the western portion of the Old North End. Uh, similarly, I think there was a big um, trade-off that we had to consider in terms of how campus areas and the downtown areas were um, paired in a district configuration with the shape of Ward 8. So similar to the, the note I just made about King Maple, um, if we pair wards one and eight together, that moves the downtown into the east district. Where if we pair wards three and eight together, it maintains the downtown and the western Old North End together in a central district the way that it does today. Uh, I think there was a question or a concern that was raised about the, just the recommendation to pair wards one and two as the east district as impacting the eastern part of the Old North End, which it does. Again, when we think about trade-offs, this is one of those areas, but we also know that because of the shape of Ward 3 in this proposed map, it does, uh, Ward 3 does include more of the western portion of the Old North End than Ward 3 does today. Um, just one final thing then, um, or I guess two. Uh, the other piece was just not a lot of certainty in terms of um, the sort of cross issues of Ward 8 being long and narrow east to west and Ward 2 being long and narrow north to south in this proposed map. Um, if we pair wards 1 and 8 in this map, it means that there is a essentially two block by three block section of the new Ward 2 that would be completely surrounded on three of its sides by a different ward and district. Um, essentially those blocks between Winooski, College, Williams, and Pearl would be surrounded by the East District while they would be part of the Central District. Um, but we do also acknowledge that either way you pair Ward 2 um, with either of its neighboring wards results in an area of the city that um, has more off-campus student population, which I know is something that many people in that area were interested in. And then the final piece was just thinking about um, 
the issue of the campus on campus population. So this has been a, a major area of focus in terms of your map making. We've typically talked about this at the ward level. Um, but in V27, it did open up some questions about how you wanted to approach um, the, war the campus population at the district level. Uh, if you maintained a pairing of wards one and eight, you could largely maintain most of the campus population in the East District as it is today. Um, but we do have the issues on the western side of the city uh, that we need to consider. Um, if we pair wards one and two, and then wards three and eight, we can also recognize an opportunity to split more of our campus population, not only among three wards, but also three districts, which I think is something um, that was just an interesting observation about that process. Um, so those are some of our considerations. I think at the end of the day, either the combination of Ward 1 and 2 or Ward 1 and 8 works from a deviation perspective, and I apologize, I think there was some wording in the memo that suggested otherwise. Um, that wasn't the intent. Uh, as far as maps V1 and V2 then, uh, these were responsive to the other requests to make minor modifications to your December map in order to address King Maple and Brooks Avenue. Uh, in both of these maps, we took a similar approach to V27 in that we maintained the boundary between Ward 1 and 2 along um, Willard Street all the way from Riverside to Pearl. Um, where our map differs is that um, instead of moving Harris Millis into Ward 6, we moved Harris Millis into Ward 1 uh, to offset the population change around Brooks Ave. Um, and again, the approach here was tr to try to make as few changes as possible to the maps that you had previously approved. Uh, in terms of how to address the King Maple neighborhood, uh, the first approach then that we took was to uh, largely move the boundary back to where it is today. Um, the boundary between Ward 3 and Ward 5 currently runs along King Street up to St. Paul Street. So this map simply makes that change to bring that boundary back. The second option, because I think we understood there may have been a greater interest in helping the Bob and Mill neighborhood become part of the downtown ward. Um, this takes a different approach in that it moves Bob and Mill and everything north into the downtown ward and addresses the, the population deviation um, by moving a block each into Ward 5 and to Ward 6. So happy to answer any other questions that you might have about those. Um, but you do have charter language to correspond with each of these three maps um, if you're interested in considering any of them. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks so much, um, Megan, for, uh, for all your work on this. Um, we will go first to um, Councillor Bergman and then to... Uh, Councilor Shannon. Well, I, I, first I want to thank Megan for the work. It's not an easy job, and it was a last minute job. Um, I want to thank you for correcting the um, error in, uh, in, in drafting that, your memo that stated that the deviations were a reason for uh, one and um, one and two to be joined, I'm glad because that removes um, that as an aspect and puts it back where it belongs, which is a political conversation here as opposed to a, a pseudo legal conversation. So thank you for that and let me just turn. If ever there was a reason why the districts don't work for me, it was that conversation that we just had related to uh, the pairing of them. And uh, we did get public comment tonight about the districts not being something that is wanted. So it is still in my mind, even though I don't know that I have the votes, something that uh, is a live political question because I, I think that the conversation that we had raises another problem with that. But let me just say that the 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 ward uh, the, the 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 27 map is one that is closest to an historic 
breakdown of the old North End. None of you were around when I represented Ward 2 in 1986 and not, not on this council. Yeah, lots of you were around. <laughs> None of you were here in this room when that happened. Um, and um, I can tell you that I represented a ward that went from my part of the, this, the, the ward, which is by the Boys and Girls Club, as probably all of you know, um, all the way to Main Street. So it included the Bradley and Buell and Hungerford area, right? We always had that. And that was something maybe, I don't know when it came, but I believe that it well predated my coming on to the council. So at least a, uh, a redistricting or more before, before that. So um, the, the pairing of Ward 2 with Ward 1 to create the East District is a severing of the, uh, the Old North End. And I have not thought that despite all the conversations that we were really engaged in quote unquote gerrymandering, which I think, this is previous, I think uh, is about the dilution of votes vis-a-vis uh, -vis certain people. In this case, in the old North End, it's primarily the working class folks. The severing of that connection to me smacks of gerrymandering. I, I think it's outrageous and, um, and therefore fundamentally wrong. Um, so I'm happy to have heard Director Tuttle say that, you know, there are reasons to match, you know, different wards uh, together here. The, and so it becomes back to us as a, as a uh, political process. I want the old North End to have the integrity that we said. I want the historic nature of Ward 2 to be kept um, intact. I think this does for the, uh, the folks in Ward 8 what a lot of what they said they wanted. They, I mean, before there were 80% or so that were on campus. This and all the, the, the map that we have in front of us does this too. But this map does it, that's 49%, just like Ward 6. Um, it's true that it's about twice the number of on-campus students uh, as Ward 1. Ward 1 carries lots of off-campus Students, anybody who knows that, who just ran for, uh, for election, knows that. And the bringing in of the Buell Street um, area into Ward 2 makes that adjustment in terms of off-campus um, students um, somewhat mitigated. Um, so I personally am in favor of the, the new map, if the districts are done right, if we're gonna have districts, again, I think it is prudent not to have districts, but if we are to have districts, then two and three and one and eight, the nature of the district system is odd. And you know the fact that it goes from the lake to the river is a um, you know is an issue that I think uh, we we confront my my ward or our our ward wards two and three if they were together go from the lake to the river it's just a different part of the river that uh, that you get to um, same thing with uh, the new north end so I just want to let you know that I, I I think it will be a it would be a terrible decision of yours to, um, uh, to, to sever the old North End. And I, if, if you decide to do that, but if you don't, then the, um, uh, the ward, the, uh, the 27 map is my favorite 
one or the one that I favor. Uh, the, que the tweak maps, I think, do uh, our improvement over the existing ones, but I would hope that we would um, move to the, uh, the version 27 with the uh, wards uh, two and three uh, district if we maintain the districts. And thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. We'll go to Councillor Shannon and anyone else who wishes to speak. Go ahead. Thank you, President Paul. Now I have so many more questions in my head. I just had like one simple question when I raised my hand, which was for Director Tuttle. Um, and it, one of the last things you said was explaining the changes that um, you made in the King Maple area. And you referenced moving a block, one block in Ward 5 and one block in Ward 6. And if you can clarify which map you were talking about and which blocks you were talking about moving. Because it's been a, a little bit hard to follow this, this version. We don't have the overlays, and so I'm looking at them side by side. I think I mostly know. And the other thing, we, we don't have um, a reference here as to the status quo. I have the one we adopted, um, the two that you tweaked and made some changes in that area. So if you could just clarify the five, six, and three. Sure. Um, I don't know if it would be easiest if somebody could make me a panelist. I am on the Zoom meeting, um, and I could, oh, it looks like I can share my screen. <laughs> One second. Okay. So, um, This is the current um, boundary between wards three and five in your district or in your wards today. So ward three is in the red north of King Street and ward five is to the south in brown. In your map that was approved in December, this is what happens to those ward boundaries. Um, so north of King Street, only between uh, the basically the King Street Dock and up to Champlain Street stays in Ward 3, but uh, the two blocks then immediately to the east between South Champlain and St. Paul um, also move into Ward 3 from Ward 5. The, all right, let's see here. What's the best way to do this? Um, so this is now the boundary that you have been discussing in your public hearing. The first version that we proposed just moves this boundary back uh, to where it exists today, along King Street all the way to St. Paul Street. Um, the version two takes the opposite approach here, uh, which is to move um, these two blocks back into Ward 5 um, and this area into Ward 3. And the one block that I mentioned moving into Ward 6 is right here. This is between Church, Winooski, King, and Maple. Um, so that's the difference between those two maps. Great. Thank you. That does explain it. Um, and then I had a question about what Councillor Bergman was saying. And it, um, President Paul, I don't know if you might allow Councillor Bergman to answer if he chooses. But... I, when you said, I support the map before us, there's three maps before us. So some clarification on exactly what you were saying there would help. And then it sounded like you um, liked the V27 map, and perhaps that's the map you were referring to as before us. But I'm not sure if you like that map with the pairings, If, but you don't like the map with the pairings one, two, and three, eight. And as far as the other maps, I'm assuming that, the, well, I could find out by going into the depths of the meets and bounds uh, charter change language, but I think in the others, the um, pairings all stay the same. And so you don't object to the pairings staying the same 
you object to changing those pairings in um, B27. If that's, that's my understanding, so if you can clarify. I'd be happy to, to clarify. I think taking number three first, that is correct. I do not um, object to the continued pairing of two and three and one and eight in the version that we adopted in December. That's what we have currently. I had that confirmed in the reading of the meets and bounds, and I'm going to assume that that was correct. My good friend, Councillor Busher, uh, read that to me, and I, I'm convinced that that is correct, and I see nods. So number three, uh, going to number question number one, uh, that is, uh, it, I would move, I will move when we finish our conversation, uh, and everybody gets a chance to, uh, to move the, uh, uh, the version uh, 27 map that we had. I do not believe that that map has embedded in it the pairing of the um, uh, of the uh, the district uh, the wards for districts, and I think that it would be helpful to me before I move that to know sort of whether I'm boxing myself in in terms of that in terms of the votes. Um, but my my intention will be to have that placed before us um, for our voting consideration um, to replace the uh, the current map and with regard to the uh, the tweaks that you know bring back uh, fully uh, Brooks Avenue and uh, I think both sides is it King or is it Maple whatever that joining is I, I'm fully in favor of that you guys have heard me talk about not wanting to break up streets and us having the legal ability to do that. So I think that makes lots of sense. And if I, I hope that I've answered all three of your questions. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, President Paul, I am hoping that when motions are made, they will be made with both the map with the map and the pairings together, because I think it may be important to people and how they vote. Um, I, I actually, it made sense. I, I read what um, Director Tuttle said in terms of the pairings. It made sense to me to pair them as suggested with the one, two, and the three, eight. I, that looked like the more natural pairing to me because um, of, of what she said with regards to just how the connections are made, what you're surrounded by. Um, I will say that the historic boundaries of these wards are are not important to me. I think that our task is changing those boundaries. And there are people who will not like when they get moved into one ward and out of another. And that's the unfortunate nature of our job. People don't really like change. And so they tend to be more supportive of the thing that keeps them where they are, even if it moves somebody else. Um, that that being said, my, my preference has been the um, my preference has been the V twenty seven map because I think it's a it's a better map in terms of assuring that we have enough um, longer term residents to get all the positions filled to not have too many freshmen and sophomores who are with certainty going to move and are unable to serve in these positions um, in any one ward. And I guess I'm going to listen to the discussion. I think that there's an improvement with um, the V1 and V2 maps as far as not dividing Brooks Ave, which to me is the most egregious kind of um, division on a neighborhood street that's a very small neighborhood street 
and it is and has in every way the sense of a neighborhood. So that's one of the things that has bothered me most about the map that we approved. Um, between the V1 and V2 maps, my preference would be the V2 map. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now and listen to what others have to say. I, you know, one of the things that I'm weighing here is really what other people think. I don't want us to reach a draw tonight um, and not, not get anywhere. Um, so I'll listen to what others have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Um, before we go to Councillor Hightower, I just wanted to alert the council. You can check your email. Um, there is, I had asked Attorney Sturdivant and um, whether or not she could give me motion language in advance um, should there be a desire to change from the approved map to an another map. And so you'll see um, in your email there is a motion. Um, it just simply says the XYZ map. You can fill that in. Um, if there are other changes other than this that relate to district boundaries, um, then we'll have to work through that language. That's not in this motion, um, but just wanted to let you know. And, and in fact, yes, the pairing does have to happen. Just also for the benefit of the public, this is the last possible council meeting that we can vote on this. Anything further than this would necessitate a special meeting next week. Ballots must be delivered, um, the, the wording of the ballots must be delivered by February 1st. So this is our last meeting to be making this decision. Um, Councillor Hightower. Um, my comments will be more global um, maybe than some of the others, which is to say, well, first of all, I just have to also say thank you to Megan Tuttle. I know I'm biased because I was on the DRB and then when I joined council immediately went to ordinance, but how lucky we are to have you as a director, I think is just s extremely evident in every dealing with you. And so just a huge thank you both to this and to all of the work you do. Um, and then I have to say I was pretty discouraged um, with the original map that we voted on. I think it's just a blow to the democratic process when we set out with certain goals and then we put out something that as I think, I don't know if it was Chris or RBJ who pointed it out, but that meets none of the goals that we set out. Um, and so I'm happy to see three maps that I at least wouldn't ardently fight against um, in terms of at least accomplishing some of the goals that we set out to what Councilor Bergman said, I would rather <laughs> see us also do away with districts, but I think, um, I think these are inoffensive maps, which I think is <laughs> um, a good place to get to um, by today. Um, I, I strongly appreciate um, the work of my Democratic colleagues in doing tweaks to the map, especially to get Brooks Ave um, into Ward 1, um, I think that creates for more consistency. I still feel like Ward, the boundary between Ward 8 and Ward 6 is weird, um, and it bothers me that it's not continuous on streets, um, but I can let that go, and I can let one thing go in the spirit of compromise. Um, so I wouldn't object to any of these maps. I will let my <laughs> counselors, um, the other counselors, work through um, which one we're gonna end up with. I do hope we end up with one of these three maps um, in particular. Um, and maybe, maybe I will leave it at that as the, I don't, as somebody who for a long time was, Ward 1 and Ward 8 used to NPA together, so I feel like I have some affinity to Ward 8, um, although I know they didn't necessarily agree with me on the mapping over the last, um, couple of weeks. I know that Ward 1 and Ward 8 together wouldn't be the East District anymore. Um, it'd be more of a combination of East District and Downtown. I don't see that as problematic, so I would defer to other counselors in terms of if they want to keep the 2-3 or 1 and 8 pairing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Are there other counselors who wish to speak to this item? Any of the maps. We actually we actually have four maps that are listed under under this. There's the two city edit maps, there's the approved map, and then there is the V27. Councillor Barlow. 
Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I just want to reiterate what I said at the, when we were discussing this um, at the last public hearing. Um, I'm extremely uncomfortable making significant changes to the maps after all the public process we had put into arriving at the approved map. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that um, I don't agree with the characterization that we didn't hit all of the, uh, any of the objectives. I do think we've significantly changed the character of Ward 8. It no longer has 70 some odd percent um, student, on-campus students, and in the approved map, we've added um, a significant number of stable, longer-term residents. So I think we actually did achieve in some ways the objective of improving Ward 8. And so I just want to reiterate that because many in, you know, in public and even on this council have stated that we didn't hit any of the objectives and I just don't see it that way. Um, my preference would be to stick with the approved map and to make some tweaks um, around the King Maple neighborhood. Um, but I, I realize that I, that probably doesn't have support here tonight, but I'll just say it out loud in case I can get any traction with that. Um, that would be my preference, so thank you. Thanks, Councilor Barlow. Um, any other councilors who wish to speak to the maps? And I know you wanted to make a motion, so if, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, it was Councilor Travers, and then we can go back to Councilor Shannon and then Bergman. Thanks, President Paul. I just want to say I, I agree with and echo the comments of Councillor Barlow. Councillor Barlow and I, along with Councillors Hightower and McGee, uh, served on, on the working group here and spent uh, a really significant amount of time looking at various maps, partnering with Director Tuttle and, and Nancy Stetson. And, and I want to echo Councillor Hightower's points as well. We, we've said thank you many times over, but can't say thank you enough for your office's work on these maps. Um, and while I, I deeply respect uh, the, the comments and, and my colleagues and Councilor Hightower and, and Councilor Bergman, um, I, I agree with Councilor Barlow. I, I don't think we're missing the mark uh, on the original map, the map that the council previously approved. Uh, we've heard some public comments about um, the goals that were laid out uh, by the ad hoc redistricting committee. Uh, but if you go back and look at the written report of that ad hoc redistricting committee, you know, they identified three themes. Theme one, Ward 8 is not working in its current configuration. Theme two, residents are not in favor of the district system. Theme three, the ward configuration must preserve neighborhoods, keep wards compact, and provide equal representation. Uh, the, the, we've heard some discussion about you know, the, the Maple King neighborhood and so on, and uh, I, I am a proponent of keeping that uh, neighborhood all together, but it, but it is not, I should point out, one of the themes that was identified by uh, the ad hoc redistricting group. The main theme that was addressed by that group, theme one, was uh, addressing the Ward 8 configuration. And I, I certainly take exception to using the word gerrymander uh, to refer to the map that was approved by this council. Uh, I mean, speaking very frankly here, during this redistricting process, you know, two of our progressive colleagues left this council. And, and if we wanted to gerrymander a map, to favor one political party over the other, we had every opportunity to do so. Uh, but we have not done that. Um, we've continued to work hard uh, with our progressive colleagues, uh, work hard with our independent colleagues. We've continued to uh, meet with neighbors in wards one and wards eight and wards six and, and across the city to try to come up with a map that best addresses concerns, that best addresses Again, that theme one that was addressed, which is the Ward 8 configuration. To me, that's still the original map. I completely respect why the residents of, of Ward 1 and, and the folks that represent Ward 1 uh, don't love the map that they came up with. I, I completely get that. If I represented Ward 1, I'd probably feel the same way. Um, but to me, the original version is still the best bet. So um, th that would be the, the way I would go. Um, if, if the wind is blowing in the direction of folks not wanting the original map, uh, my preference would be the city edits version two, uh, if only because uh, it does address the, the Maple King um, neighborhood. Um, so thank you, President Paul. Uh, thank you, Councillor Travers. So we'll go to uh, Councillor Shannon and then to Councillor Bergman. Thank you, President Paul. 
Um, as I was trying to hold out the questions in my head, I realized I forgot the most important thing that I did want to say, which was a huge thank you to you, Director Tuttle. Um, we, I don't know if we could have put more pressure on, on you and your colleagues throughout this entire process. Um, I appreciate your patience, your diligence, your thoroughness, uh, and that you somehow got this completely unreasonable request done, and I'm really sorry to do that to you. At the same time, I think it's our, it is our duty. Um, this is a really important decision for us, and as badly as I felt um, making that ask of our city staff, I just really felt that this is critically important to get as right as we can. Um, uh, Councillor Barlow just um, made mention of not supporting any major changes, but supporting tweaks to the King Maple neighborhood. And I think that that's largely what has been offered in um, particularly V2. Um, and so I was interested to hear what Councillor Barlow's, if, if that's Councillor Barlow's interpretation of those maps, because I don't think we can make any new tweaks. So if he's in favor of that, I'd, I'd like to have a little clarity on exactly what that means, because I think we're all on the assumption we are not going back and asking for more maps. I'm really hoping that that is, uh, that is one thing we can reach consensus on here right off the bat. Um, Secondly, I think it would be my preference rather than going forward with the map I want, if we could go forward with eliminating maps would kind of be my preference. I, I don't think that's where Councillor Bergman was going. So I'm offering that as a thought for you to consider. Um, because I, I am not sure um, necessarily ready to vote yay or nay on a specific map. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. We'll go to uh, Councillor Bergman. Uh, Councillor Bergman, if you might, I just have a parliamentary inquiry, if, if you wouldn't mind my just, sure. would you mind? So I, I just want to confirm, President Paul, um, if any amendment is presented and that amendment fails, the original map has already been approved by this council and will proceed to the ballot, correct? So if, so the, the, the original map is moving forward unless any amendment succeeds, is that correct? That is, that is my understanding, that is correct. Okay, thank um, you. We can verify that with Attorney Sturtevant, but I believe that that is correct. We have already approved, um, Attorney Sturtevant, we've already approved the approved map. Um, so in the absence of any amendment passing, Correct. That is the approved map. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Councilor, uh, uh, Attorney Sturdivant, I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut you off. Oh, no. Okay. All right. So we'll go to Councilor Bergman. Thank you. Uh, it's intriguing to, <clears throat> to try a process of elimination or something, but I don't think it's all that fruitful. Um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity and the offer. But um, I am going to move the version 27 map with the pairing of wards two and three and one and eight and five and six and uh, four and seven. And uh, maybe ask for the, no, I won't ask for the floor back. I'll just see if we can move this and see what the votes are. So, thank you, Councillor Bergman. So, my understanding is, before we go to a second, my, my understanding is that you want to move to amend and place on the ballot the City Council's uh, charter change proposal regarding wards and boundaries um, uh, as, a, as approved on December 12, 2022, to reflect boundaries um, and districts as delineated in, in eight wards V27 um, with, the, with, the, with the amendment of pairing wards 1 and 8, 2 and 3, 5 and 6, and 4 and 7, subject to the final approval of the technical language by the city attorney's office. Yes, and I 
thank President Paul greatly for doing my job in making that, that motion. So no I, 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 I owe you on that one. Okay, thank you. no worries. Um, is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Councillor McGee. So we'll go to just a discussion of the motion that has, the long motion that has just been made. Are there councillors who wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Hightower and I'll, then McGee. I'll be voting for this and or any future <laughs> amendments to what is currently on the table. So <laughs> I will be voting yes. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just start with one map. Uh, Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. I am supportive of this map. I think it accomplishes uh, many of the uh, goals that not just the ad hoc committee had, but uh, the goals that we've heard from the public time and again through um, various MPA conversations and uh, discussions I've had with constituents. Um, I have heard over and over that uh, this map is uh, preferable, um, and uh, you know, I guess I will uh, leave it at that. I have said uh, ad nauseum <laughs> how I feel about uh, where we're at with the process, so uh, I won't belabor the point. Uh, and would also just like to echo the thanks that have been expressed for Director Tuttle. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Are there any other councillors who wish to speak to the motion before us before we would go to a vote? And Councillor Freeman, if you just want to use the raise hand function, I'll, I'm happy to recognize you. President Paul, would it be okay for me to ask? This is me, sorry. Oh, uh, I'm looking over on. here. Um. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I felt like I was like, oh my goodness. Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear um, on on the motion language, and I don't know if Attorney Sturdivant could help me. Um, I know one part of the work that, that our office was doing in preparation for tonight's meeting was making sure that you actually had resolution language that supported a map that you may ultimately vote on, and I just wanted to make sure that the, um, with appropriate technical corrections, would be the language we need to make the switch in the ward pairing because the language you have for V27 is describing the recommendation that we had offered. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. Uh, thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, uh, Attorney Sturdivant? Was there, a, go ahead. Um, I mean, you, you could amend the, the motion just to say um, the delineated in in the that particular map 27 um, and with the correlating resolution subject to final approval of the technical language by the city attorney's office. Okay, so we will with um, with the permission of the first and seconder we'll add that language to the yes yes that amendment is friendly to both of you Correct. Yes. Yep. okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for that clarification. Um, if there are no other counselors who wish to speak to this, since we have someone participating by Zoom and doesn't appear as though this is going to be a unanimous vote, um, Lori, if you could ro uh, call the roll for us, please. Barbara. No. Barbara. Yes. No. <laughs> uh, no. No. Yes. 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 No. 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 Okay, so that motion fails. We are back to, uh, at this point, the approved map. Um, if there are other motions that um, others wish to make. Uh, Councillor Hightower. I don't actually, I wasn't listening to the amendment that Councillor Tuttle suggested, so. 
I will make. I wasn't either. I will make the <laughs> move to amend and place on the ballot the city council's charter change proposal regarding ward boundaries as approved on December 12, 2022, to reflect the boundaries as delineated in the version two map, subject to final approval of the technical language by the city attorney's office. And Kim, I don't know if you. Have. I'm. I'm not that, sure, yeah, Kim. Do we have to add the additional language since we are going with? The, uh, since Councillor Hightower's motion is to go with the map. Uh, the clarification that I offered was only because the proposed ward pairings that Councillor Bergman offered were different from what you have. So I don't think that's relevant to this. Okay. All right, so um, a motion uh, to amend in place, the, um, in place of the approved map, uh, city edits version two um, has been made. And is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councillor Shannon. Uh, so we'll go to discussion on this motion. Are there councillors who wish to um, add, any, um, add any comments to this discussion? Uh, Councillor Barlow. Thank you, President Paul. Um, since I neglected to thank Director Tuttle, I'd like to do so at this time as well. <laughs> we, well what, we've asked, what we've asked of you is, is really unreasonable, so thank you for <laughs> indulging us in that. Um, and I'd also like to address uh, Councillor's Councilor Shannon's comments earlier. Um, what what version one and version two um, take away are the stable residents from Ward Eight that were an essential part of fixing the Ward Eight problem, um, and so and so that is uh, that is a significant change in my view. Um, so I will not be supporting this. Are there any other councilors who wish, thank you, Councilor Barlow, are there any other councilors who wish to speak to the motion uh, regarding uh, city edit V2, the map V2? Okay, well then I guess we will go to a vote. Um, don't know if this will be unanimous, so I think we will do this by roll. Um, Lori, if you could call the roll, please. No. Yes. 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 Councilor Traverse? No. City Council President Paul? No. Uh, the motion passes. And with that, we are, we are done with redistricting. Um, Megan, you've heard from so many of us. Um, you've got a huge fan club over here. Thank you so, so much to you, to Nancy, to Sarah for all your efforts. Um, we've reached the end of the road and uh, thank you again. I'll gladly part ways with you here, but I'll see you on many other things soon. <laughs> uh, we will now move on to item 7.02, which is um, a tobacco license application for Campus Kitchen. Um, for a motion on that, uh, can I go to Councillor Shannon? Quite all right. Move to approve the tobacco license application for Campus Kitchen. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, seconded by Councillor McGee. Uh, all those in favor of the motion as made by Councillor Shannon, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Which brings us to item 7.03, which is, uh, bless you, <laughs> bless you, um, city council rules. And uh, for this, this is a discussion item that will come to us, come with a motion as once we, once we decide on what the motion will be and there are two options that are listed on board docs. Um, for an overview of the uh, changes to our council rules, I will go to one of the three members of the 
small working group and that being Councillor Hightower. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna give a brief presentation on all of the changes just because I think we at least agreed as a working group that it was helpful for us to review the rules of our body um, so that we can follow them. Um, the first chapter on the presiding officer doesn't have many changes in it um, other than the president shall be elected not just by a majority of the body president but by a majority of the pro of the body. That's the only change we made um, each year at 7 p.m. on the first Monday in April. Um, we made no changes to the rest of section one. We made no changes to section two. For section three, um, we just made some changes, technical changes in accordance with changes to Vermont open meeting law. Um, make sure we're tying to that. For committee assignment and rules, we made a few clarifying changes as well as I just wanna highlight some of the rules, um, which is to codify that the council president shall serve as an ex officio member of all committees and may serve as a voting member in the absence of an appointed committee member or as a result of a vacancy on the council. Um, the president shall appoint all ad hoc committees unless the council votes by majority of those present to designate the members. Um, things that are in committee cannot be taken up again in the council unless two thirds of the council votes to take it up again, a majority of the council votes to take it up at a subsequent meeting, not to happen one week no sooner than one week after the vote, or the matter has been sitting in the committee for at least three city council meetings. Um, we removed the requirement that folks annually prepare a written mission statement to be submitted at the annual meeting of the city council and instead have added the requirement that committee chairs shall prepare a brief report or supply the meetings of their committees meetings to the entire city council, which is in line with what we discussed at our council retreat. Um, individual councilors and committees shall not assign or request significant assignments be carried out by city departments without receiving the endorsement from the entire council. However, city departments may bring items to the committee for consideration without endorsement. We have added the requirement that if an ad hoc or standing committee member misses three or more meetings within a council year, the president, council president may rescind the appointment and appoint another counselor to fill the vacancy. So a lot of changes to that section. Um, section five is place and date of meetings and what a quorum consists of. Um, we didn't, the biggest change that we made I think is changing it. Is this in the right thing? I guess I should have gone off the notes. Um, but we assigned specific times, so we added up to 60 minutes for public forums, five minutes for committee chairs, and, and formalized the priority given to Burlington residents before non-Burlington residents. We made no changes to section six, which are the duties of the presiding officer for member responsibilities. We clarified um, how nominations will happen as well as votes. Um, codified that when possible, counselors shall submit questions to staff and presenters in advance of the meetings. And that, and the next section in section eight, that amendments should be sent when possible in advance of the meeting. And then in section, we made no changes to section nine, 10, or 11. And in section 12, or for city councilor absences, we clarified that folks can join by electronic means consistent with Vermont law, um, but that the expectation is that members are expected to participate in person with rare exceptions, and apparently that attendance records will be published annually. <laughs> and we made no changes to section 13 or section 14. In section 15, we changed the start times that work session or executive sessions shall not start before 5 p.m. as opposed to 6 p.m. 
We changed public forum from having a time certain of 7.30 to starting no earlier than 6 p.m. and no later than 7.30 p.m. and lasting for 60 minutes. And we added counselor reflections on public comments, on public forum, excuse me, and these comments must be in response to comments heard at the public forum and they will have no longer than one minute per counselor. We made no changes to section 16 except to clarify that it could be board docs or other board management software considering our impending change. We made no changes to section 17, 18, 19, 20, or 21. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Um, so as I said, there are two options when it comes to a motion. Um, I would open the floor to the council uh, for a discussion about our rules, and then based on that, perhaps um, we can come to a um, consensus as far as whether we wish to adopt what you've just heard, or um, if more time is needed, and we would then go and uh, discuss this again at our February 6th meeting. Are there any counselors who wish to speak to any aspect of our rules? Uh, Councilor Bergman. Um, I'm not really prepared to uh, to make a decision on them. Um, I think that's just simple. I mean, whether it gets referred to the ordinance committee, uh, to the charter change committee, we are not going to be meeting until March. Whether if you feel a need to uh, to speed things up, I perhaps we could uh, schedule another meeting to deal with this, but it would not be my preference. Um, but uh, at the very, yeah, I, I, so I would like us to defer and, and probably refer it to the, uh, to the Charter Change Committee, but um, I'm open to hearing uh, more on that. Thank you. If there are counselors who have suggestions over what we've just heard or wish to make them at a, um, wish to make them after, after this evening, Hopefully they will come forward and, and do so if there are things that we need to change or counselors who wish to make other changes. Um, is it the general consensus of the council that we need more time? Councilor Shannon. Um, I wouldn't mind it going to charter change to have another group of counselors kind of giving it a thorough once over. Was that a motion? I didn't want to be so bold, President Paul. <laughs> oh, let's be bold. <laughs> if, it would, if you're asking for it, I will move um, to refer this to charter change for further review. The motion is made to refer this to charter change for further review. Is there a second? I'd second it. Seconded by Councilor Bergman. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Councilor Barlow. Um, I, I believe when in, in our small group we had talked about our intent of having these rules in, adopted and in place before we uh, set the next council in April, and I'm wondering, based on Councilor Bergman's um, charter change schedule, if that's a reasonable expectation. Councilor Bergman? Um, if my fellow committee members uh, care to meet uh, sooner than we had... Uh, anticipated uh, for the purpose of dealing with this? I think the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that was, that certainly was our our hope. Um, these count, the desire to redo some aspects of our council rules came as a result of our retreat that was back in May. And um, uh, it's taken us some time to get here, but it would be great if we could move that forward if you are willing to make that change in calendar. Um, so, if there is there any other are there any other other comments from counselors on the motion before us to refer this to charter change? Uh, there is a second. The second was by Mar uh, Councilor Bergman, made by Councilor Shannon. Um, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to refer this to charter change, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, so we will refer that to the Charter Change Committee and um, we'll hope to have that back in, it wasn't part of the motion, but we'll hope to have that back sometime in March. Um, that will bring us to item 7.04, which is a resolution determination of the need for concise summary 
of charter change amendments on ballots and in the warning. And for a motion on this, I'll go to the chair of charter change, which is Councillor Bergman for a motion. So I would move the resolution that is on board docs um, with the um, amendment on line 15 within the parentheses, it's the third word, it says attached to say uh, V3 1.22.23 GB proposed amendment. That is just the, uh, the language that we have that was posted early on board docs today that has the, the amendment that I offered um, in relationship to the, uh, the, all, the all legal resident voting in local elections to clarify what legal residence means and uh, Okay, Councillor Councilor um, uh, Bar uh, Bergman, can you just tell us on there are five attachments that are on this agenda item, and can you just repeat which is the one the short form? It would be proposal? the top. It would be the top one. Okay, so it's the one town meeting day twenty three yes. V three that was done today, June yes. uh, January twenty two. Yes, the second one is my m email that uh, mm -hmm. sort of identifies it. It was early in the morning. Uh, I suspect that we will have another, um, we'll have an, a further um, amendment or action on this, but this gets us started. Okay, so motion is made by Councillor Bergman to move the uh, version, uh, the, the resolution and version three, um, one twenty two twenty three. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Uh, I, yes, um, okay. Um, the, uh, seconded, by, seconded by Councillor McGee. Um, did you want the floor back, uh, Councillor Bergman? Um, I, I, I hope I don't need it, except people saw, I think, my, you know, the proposed, the email and the reasoning for it. Otherwise, everything is as was proposed. I think that the, uh, the items um, are basically good, although I th think we'll hear um, a proposed amendment to... Uh, uh, to change it slightly. Okay, this is the thank most you. Appropriate way to start. Okay, thank you, Councilor Bergman. So, um, is there an amendment to the concise the concise language attachment? Are there? Uh, yes, from Councilor uh, Councilor Travers. Uh, so we'll follow along here. Uh, so uh, I would uh, move to amend Councilor Bergman's amendment uh, to. Uh, reflect um, instead of uh, 12223, the GB proposed amendment to reflect the attachment, uh, which is labeled Q's 1 to 3 short form question charter change proposals, town meeting day 23, BJT proposed amendment with GB amendment. And if uh, the uh, initial uh, mover of that amendment is friendly to it, uh, that would be my ask. Uh, because it incorporates the amendment that we put forward in my, in, in my motion, and it just simply reorganizes and makes clearer, and the maker of the amendment can explain a little bit more of the, the thinking behind that, um, the answer is yes, this is very friendly. Would that also be friendly to the seconder? It is friendly to the seconder. So um, uh, since we do friendly amendments, um, that would mean that this language that has been proposed as an amendment by Councillor Travers would now be added to the, um, well, not to the resolution, but to the referenced attachment. Um, did you want the floor back, uh, Councillor Travers? Sure, if only to just briefly explain um, yes. So I, I completely. Could I, could I have a point of information before yes. you explain? Because <laughs> I'm a little lost. Um, is there a document on here that incorporates both those amendments, or do I need to look? I need to combine to. The answer is the very last document, which says Q's one, two, three short form and the end of it says BJT proposed amendments with GB. So it's the last thing, it was amended during our meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was added, I should say, onto, the bo onto board docs 
during our meeting. So to my mind, it makes it most appropriate to be dealt with as an amendment to the main motion, which is why it was there because it was nobody had a chance to see it. But um, it's very friendly because it keeps the, um, the change that I had proposed early this morning and it just reorganizes and then the, 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 the ordering of the ballot and it then asks um, for some other changes that Councillor Travers can, um, can explain but that I support. Does that answer your question? Nope. So okay. I'll just listen to what Councillor Travers has to say and see if I figure it out from there. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe in the interest of, you know, making sure that we're all on the same page, Councillor Travers, if you can just um, show where those paragraphs go into the um, uh, the proposed attachment that we've already, um, which is the first item on this agenda item. Sure. To be clear, the version that was moved by Councillor Bergman incorporates all five of the proposed charter questions that are going to the town meeting day ballot. The amendment to which Councillor Bergman is friendly modifies questions one to three uh, as reflected in the document Qs one to three, short form question charter change proposals, town meeting day 23, BJT proposed amendment with GB amendment. And what this does is um, I completely agree with Councillor Bergman's uh, addition to the proposed charter change short form question on uh, legal resident voters. Uh, in speaking to Councillor Bergman about it, we thought that um, the order of this would make sense where that question would go first now in, in the amendment to which Councillor Bergman is friendly. Then the second question would be um, that regarding uh, the siting of polling places. And what this amendment does is it, it consolidates um, this issue into a single paragraph. It clarifies uh, that, uh, and I should say that the, the way that the short form question was written previously, it indicated that the purpose of this change was to allow, this is gonna get complicated, but, um, but basically it, the, the goal here with the second question, and I would defer to Councilor Bergman on this as chair of the Charter Change Committee, was, was really the language around the location of polling places and the ability to cite two polling locations in, in, in the same, uh, place and so in, in consolidating this into a single paragraph here I think that it makes it clearer and then a constituent actually pointed out in question number three that it should be uh, ranked choice voting R-A-N-K-E-D as opposed to rank choice voting uh, so that is the proposed amendment in question three. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you. Um, I believe in this amendment, uh, in question two, charter change qualifications of voters and siting of polling places, that there is a typo. Um, it's right about in the middle of that paragraph, and if you're looking at it on um, Word, you'll notice a little red line under the second two. It says two two. It says two two. Yes. I think that corre a technical correction like that can be made without any kind of parliamentary procedure. Hopefully, one would hope. <laughs> Are there any other counselors who wish to speak to the? Um, actually, you have. Yes, we have. We have done that. We have already we have already voted on that. So, or we haven't voted. It was friendly. Um, okay. So we are on the resolution as presented and the short form question charter attachment um, as amended. Um, are there any counselors who wish to speak to the resolution or attachment? Seeing none, uh, we will go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the. Uh, resolution and proposed attachment um, resolution or the resolution and the proposed short form concise language attachment please say aye aye aye, aye. yes 
No, we've we have amended the we have amended the attachment. We and so now we're voting on the the whole. We didn't vote on a we we didn't vote on the amendments to one to three because it was friendly to the first and seconder. We did not vote on that, so that has been incorporated into the um, the short form question charter change proposal, town meeting day twenty three v three one twenty two twenty three. So what we're voting on now is the resolution as drafted and the first item that is on this um, as amended. I'm just making sure that Councillor Shannon knows what we're voting on. At any time. That's all right. Why don't we why don't we take uh, why don't we take okay because we can certainly take a couple of minutes. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, okay. So, uh, without further delay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Please say no. Uh, that motion passes, and we have. Um, our ballot language, um, which is great. So that will move us on to item 7.05, well, which is... Uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, I, I, there's another motion on 7.04. So we've, we've dealt with the amendment to questions one to three, but if it would be in order, uh, I would now like to offer another amendment uh, to... Oh. Uh, ...modify uh, the language for questions four and five. Okay, so... Just to clarify what we, we had already gone, we didn't make a, there was no vote on the amendments that you had made, Councillor Travers, because they were friendly to the first and seconder. So that never happened because we didn't need for it to happen. So that's why I went to a vote on the overall, on the overall. However, if that isn't, if there is an additional amendment that you wish to make, then my apologies, we weren't ready for a vote. So I guess we need to go back. Um, so as a, a point of order, I'm sure that you can get there from here, but how about if we make the proper um, parliamentary steps to do that? Yes. Thank you. Why don't we do that? So if um, the parliamentarian needs a couple of minutes, we can, we can give you five. Can we just move to reconsider? I'd like to right. move to reconsider. <laughs> motion I'll is made. <laughs> okay, you're all way ahead of me. Um, motion is made to reconsider by Councillor Shannon. Just need to be able to reflect this in the minutes. And that was seconded by Councillor Freeman, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, so there's a motion. The motion is to reconsider the vote that we just took. Um, and is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none. Yes. Councillor Bur Councillor Councillor Jang. Yeah. Just to say thank you, Councillor Freeman, for pointing that out. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Um, any other comments on from councillors on the motion? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion to reconsider, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. We are back to where we started a few minutes ago. Um, Councillor Travers, you have another amendment. Yeah, uh, thank you, President Paul. And so uh, just by means of explanation here, uh, again, there are uh, five short form questions to the ballot on our five proposed charter changes. Uh, I, I had spoken to Councillor Bergman before the meeting with respect to questions one, two, three, and understood that uh, he would be friendly to that amendment, which is why I broke it out that way. Have not. Uh, had an opportunity uh, to speak to Councilor Bergman and a number of our colleagues here with respect to this motion, which would now be with respect to questions four and five. 
Uh, and so I, I would move to amend um, the language, uh, short form language for questions four and five uh, to reflect the language incorporated in the attachment cues four to five, short form question charter change proposals, town meeting day 23, BJT proposed amendment, and would ask for the floor back upon a second. Okay, so um, my understanding is normally I would go and ask the first and seconder if this was friendly. I still, in the interest of following that procedure, we should ask if the, this this amendment is friendly to the to the maker and the seconder. It is not. I actually haven't read it, so I'm just seeing that it's posted. Now it was posted on 919. I've obviously been talking a lot, so. Um, so the answer okay. is no. All right. Um, you have to refresh. So it has, the, this item, if you, you're going to need to refresh board docs in order to see this. Um, I think it's fair to say that a number of us haven't read this. Um, and in the interest of being able to do that, um, we'll take a 10 minute recess and everyone will have the chance to read this, this language. So we will reconvene at 10, at, um, at 9.40, promptly. And hopefully everyone has had a chance to read um, the amendment. This is Q4 to 5, uh, short form, um, short form charter, charter change. I can't read the whole thing. Um, okay, this is Q's. Four to five short form question charter change proposals town meeting day. Um, so uh, I apologize. I'm I'm now I'm forgetting when we when we took the break we had not you had not had a chance to really introduce that. Did you want to Did you want to speak to that, Councillor Travers? Uh, so, so and and just to be clear, Madam President, yep. the basis for my um, not accepting this as friendly was that I hadn't read it. And I have had a chance to read it, and I find it to be friendly. Okay, that's thank you. Um, is that friendly to the seconder? It is. Uh, then, per our per our procedure, we do not need to take a vote on that. We will incorporate that into the attachment. Um, is everyone clear on what is being changed? And perhaps, Councillor Travers, you could detail that. Yeah, thank you, President Paul. Uh, first and foremost, I, I want to thank our city attorney's office that uh, has been working tirelessly, uh, short-staffed, uh, to keep that office running at an incredibly high level, including in assisting the Charter Change Committee, including in um, dealing with, with five questions that would be placed on the ballot. Uh, to amend our charter. Um, two of those questions, questions four and five, will be presented to, a vo to voters in a way uh, that I don't think Burlington voters are, are as familiar with, which is the petition process provided for under State Statute 17 VSA 2645. Uh, we've discussed it a bit in the public hearing here, but that petition process allows uh, for proposals to amend the charter to be placed on the ballot if the petition is signed by at least 5% of voters of the city of Burlington. Uh, we need to hold two public hearings on the matter as we have uh, today and our first public hearing on January 17th. Uh, and under state statute, the city council does not have the authority to revise a charter proposal made by petition. And given the difference between these two questions um, from the process uh, that was gone through for the first three questions uh, on the ballot and Again, given that this is a process that voters are unfamiliar with, there is some introductory language to questions four and five um, that I thought was important uh, for voters to have in hand. There's then, uh, I should say, there, there are no amendments suggested for question five, uh, which is the charter change regarding um, what's referred to as proposition zero. Uh, there is some additional language that's added to question four. Um, and, and I thought that was necessary because uh, the breadth of this proposed charter change, which using its own language stands up a, a new independent department of the city uh, comprised not only of an independent community uh, police department control board, but also provides that control board the authority to 
uh, establish and maintain an investigative office, an office that uh, can um, employ a director, an office that may hire other staff or consultants, including independent legal counsel, uh, given that the charter change has language in there about this office needing to be uh, funded with adequate appropriation. Uh, I thought it necessary to provide voters an opportunity to understand that this isn't simply um, another volunteer board and commission. You know, we have a volunteer police commission. They do excellent work. Uh, and and, um, and uh, many of our volunteer boards and commissions probably should be uh, compensated more for the work that they do. But, but this is taking it a, a, a step further in really establishing a, a new office and thought it important that voters have uh, additional information uh, along those lines. And, and also the fact that uh, the, the first thing that this proposed uh, charter change does is it does uh, completely strike through and, and remove the language uh, on the chief's authority to uh, remove a member for cause uh, and, and it replaces it with language around the independent community control board. So uh, this language um, reflects, I think, more accurately the, the, the breadth of this measure uh, and that's the reason for the amendment. Uh, thank you, Councillor Travers. Um, I do want to, um, I did want to also just make sure that everyone was aware that uh, Attorney Pellerin has just let me know, just to make sure that we're all aware that there actually are six questions that will be on the ballot. The sixth question is the one that we discussed a few minutes ago on redistricting. So there will be six total. Um, and the short language for that was approved in the other resolution, just so we're all clear on that. So we're, right now what we're talking about is five, but there is a, there is a sixth um, that will also appear on the ballot. Um, are there, um, thank you very much for that overview, uh, Councillor Travers. Are there any questions um, on what we have now by friendly amendment approved, which is the short form, the short form question, charter change proposals, town meeting day 23 verse, version three that have added questions one through three and questions four and five and the resolution that we would also be voting on. Councilor Shannon. Um, I have an additional amendment if this is an appropriate time for it. Uh, yes, it would be. Okay, my understanding is we now have um, the uh, Councilor Travers's amendment has essentially been adopted. So that's what's on the floor, so it's an amendment. Um, to that, and it adds the following language, which has been sent to you, and I'm not sure if it was put up on do board docs, um, and I will read the language, and I don't know if people want another recess to consider it, um, but I will, I will read it. I want to add this language because uh, having served on the Charter Change Committee that considered something very similar to what's being proposed now, I know that the makeup of the board was something we spent a tremendous amount of time on. It was very integral to the entire concept of, um, of what this board essentially is. And so I want that language to um, to be reflected in the charter change because I think it's, I think it's important um, and I don't, so anyway. The, um, the language is to the extent possible, the board shall include members who are black, indigenous, or other people of color, members who have lived experience with houselessness, mental health conditions, sex work, domestic violence, substance use disorder and or arrest or conviction records, members who have experience working with an organization that supports black, indigenous, or other people of color, and members who are affiliated with an organization in the field of civil rights, mental health, youth advocacy, LGBTQ advocacy, or alcohol, and other substance use. No member shall ever have been employed by a law enforcement agency. Uh, thank you, Councillor Shannon. Before we go to a second, I just want to make sure I understand. This is not posted on board docs. So is there, um, do you have, did you send, were you able to send that to I someone? sent it to everybody. Okay. Including Lori, the mayor. All right. 
I have not checked my email, so um, my apologies. Um, okay, I I don't believe maybe I've maybe I'm missing it. I don't believe I've seen. Oh yes, I do see this now. Okay, so. Um, that has not been posted to board docs is, um, I'm sorry, what? Someone send it to me, I don't have it. I don't have it either. Okay, so um, why don't we take a, why don't we, why don't we, why don't we take a, a five minute break here? Um, we will get that posted. Uh, Councilor Shannon has been posted to board docs. It is listed as additional short form language for Q4. Thank, thank you, Lori, for doing that. Um, Councilor Shannon, you've made a motion, um, and now that it has been posted and people have had a little bit of time to take a look at it, um, we'll need a second to that amendment. Is second. Seconded by Councilor Barlow. So we'll go to a discussion on this amendment. Are there any councilors who wish to offer comments on this, am on this amendment? Councilor Bergman. So uh, don't need it to be friendly because you have a second. Uh, it's not friendly. There's a lot. In the uh, um, in the proposal, and we could, and it's all important. Uh, this is aspirational; it does not do the service of a short form. The every uh, every voting booth, right? The kiosks are going to have the long form. This people can read it; it's going to be there. So uh, I, I see this as really a way to just make things more complicated for folks in the, uh, on the ballot. And it is um, not what the short form is meant to do. I think this is politically motivated more than anything myself. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. We'll go to Councillor Hightower to be followed by Councillor Barlow. Um, I maybe don't agree with this, or don't, <laughs> I won't put those sentiments behind it, but I do think that will be the I, I think that it made a lot of sense to add more language so that folks really knew what they were voting on um, because there is a lot to the proposal. I think that this is a good part of the proposal, but it doesn't, um, because it's not really binding to the city, I think it's additional language that won't necessarily change um, anyone's mind. So I think it just gives folks more to read. So I'd rather we stick with the language that we have, hope that folks actually read it and vote on that. Um, than add non-binding language. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. We'll go to Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I, I do think the short form language is important to keep it concise so people, you know, don't get lost in all the words. But one, one of the things I've consistently heard about this particular ballot item is the, the, and the thing that's most controversial, or one of the things that's very controversial about it, is that people um, that don't have law enforcement experience can participate on this board. And I think, um, as we heard from a public commenter tonight, that was um, an issue. So, uh, so I'm supporting putting this on. I think it's important for voters to have this information. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Shannon. Thank you. I just want to point out that this language is binding because what it says is to the extent possible, the board shall. It doesn't say the board should or the board may. It says the board shall. So I believe this is more than aspirational language. I believe that we are instructing the committee who selects people for the board that if they have Candidate A who meets these criteria, and there's a lot of different criteria that could be met, versus candidate B who doesn't, that the board shall include the members that meet the criteria. Um, I also think that this was, I mean, there's some things here you can like and other things maybe you don't like, and depending on who you are, you may like different ones or, or others, but this is key to the intentions of the creation of this committee, is who the committee is. Who is the oversight um, or control provided by is absolutely essential. Um, I know some people have suggested that, that I change this language, but this is just a direct quote from um, the amendment. I don't, I think it would be 
discriminatory and cherry picking for me to change the language or only to highlight, um, you know, no member shall have been employed by a law enforcement agency. I'm not trying to highlight any particular thing and that's why I thought it was important to keep it in its entirety um, so that people would understand what the intention is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. We'll go to Councillor Hightower and um, then perhaps we can go to a vote. I agree with Councillor Barlow that probably the um, controversial part of that is the no law enforcement, but I believe we already voted to add that to the language with the amendment we just passed in Councillor Traverse's um, <laughs> amendment. And so I would say we've put in the controversial bit so folks know what they're voting on. Um, and I'm not, again, I'm not sure that the rest of the language is that controversial and or so I would, I, I have not changed my mind, although I appreciate Councillor Barlow's point. I think it's already been addressed. Um, uh, yes, Councillor Shannon, then we'll go to Councillor Carpenter and Jang. Yeah, and I was trying to quickly reference um, what uh, Councillor Travers had put forward to see, because I thought that I had seen that language um, but I'm happy to remove that language if it's already in there because that's redundant and we certainly don't need redundancy in a short form question. So, um, okay, and I see it there. So uh, if it's friendly to myself and the <laughs> seconder, I will remove that last se sentence due to redundancy. I think, I, think we're all, I think we're all set with Councilor yeah. Shannon's consi uh, consideration on this. Councilor Barlow, is that okay with you? Great. Um, we'll go to Councilor Carpenter to be followed by Councilor Chang. Thanks. Um, I just offline had a discussion. I remember the first year we s sent out, um, automatically sent out ballots. We did, in fact, include the whole form of our charter changes. And this is a very long one. Um, that was my ask. But in conversation with CAO Shad, um, we did agree that I feel it, it's very necessary that as a supplement, so to speak, that we have um, clear instructors, not on the ballot, but with the ballot, about where we get information. And hopefully the city website will be organized well enough that it will be simple for people to go to one place and get the long form. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. We'll go to Councillor Chang. <coughs> Thank you, President, and I will not be supporting this because I think the, my colleagues talked extensively about it because from my perspective, this is a fact that I do the extent possible, meaning that we are not serious. If you're serious, the board shall, and it's a binding. It will be part of it. And I think also the other argument is Right after we vote on this, there are BIPOC organizations that will be taking these ballot items to try to translate them and make them available in public voting places. And these are expensive, um, you know, um, and confusing at the same time. From my perspective, this is not a good amendment to have right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Chang. Uh, Councillor uh, Freeman. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was just sort of thinking out loud about this as we go along. I guess I'm a little bit confused because we do already have the line about never having been employed by a law enforcement agency, which seems to be succinct um, because none of the other aspects actually preclude someone from having other types of experience with law enforcement. like. You can have experienced houselessness, but have like be a lawyer, or you can have experience, you can have been done sex work or have mental health conditions or, or whatever other components people are looking for. I guess maybe because it doesn't proactively say that to an extent possible. And I, I don't remember exactly what people were looking for, except for it sounded like they want people who have specifically maybe worked in law enforcement. And I think that is already in there, the line succinctly that people have not worked in law enforcement agencies. So I don't feel like it is, um, I don't feel like we're hiding or obscuring anything 
um, by not including it in the short form. And then certainly this language itself can be exact can be accessed in the long form. And there is this just sort of odd um, tenor to the conversation that feels sort of bizarrely like like pretty um, sort of oddly like discriminatory and and weird and sort of um, like we have sort of in the charter change language asked people to have um, you know sort of called certain aspects of political and social identity but it certainly doesn't preclude maybe some of the other aspects of their identity or their professional life and so if the issue is really around not having people who've worked in law enforcement agencies, that is already in the short form language. So it it's odd. It, it's this is just odd to me, and um, I I don't think I will not be supporting it. And um, I I was thinking it out loud a little bit, so I hope that was cohesive enough. But um, yeah, and maybe Councillor Barlow or Councillor Shannon can speak towards exactly what they were proactively looking for on the board, or they feel that. Um, members of the community that have reached out to them, other than the fact that people work have worked in law enforcement, um, because I don't think any of these identities preclude any other aspect of someone being on the board. Um, it simply precludes that one thing that is is actually limited in the language, which is in the short form language. Um, so I, I I don't think it would make sense to put this in the short form. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Freeman. Just just so you're aware, because we will go to a vote on this after, the line about no member shall be have been employed by a law enforcement agency, that I, that was removed because that I that word that wording is actually already in the um, uh, the short form that we already approved as right. friendly from Councillor Travers to um, to be added earlier. So right. just, so, just, so you're, just so you know what we're, what we're voting on. We're not voting on that line, we're voting on the rest of it. No, no, and I think that's, that's the point, is that it's already in what we will have approved so that it doesn't, so the additional aspect, even without the employed by law enforcement agency, it doesn't make sense to me. I hope that made sense. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Councilor Shannon, and then let's try to go to a vote. Um, thank you. I, I included the law enforcement piece only to make it whole to explain um, what the goals were for people serving on this board. So I wouldn't say that that was the most important part to me. I know that Councillor Barlow um, did make that comment, but that was not that was not my comment. I just wanted people to know in whole what the goals were for this board. And I think Councillor Jang also raised a very good point about translation. And so I wanted to be sure that the um, long form was being translated, not just the, okay. The, so, so does everybody get the long form in the mail translate? Oh, you have to request the other, okay. Good, thank you. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to include the language that is under additional short form language for, f for Q4. So we all know what we're voting on. We're voting on the language that was submitted by Councillor Shannon and seconded by Councillor Barlow. It does not include the very last line, last sentence um, that has been removed. Uh, with that, we'll go to a vote um, and try to do this by, or by a show of hands. All those in favor of the motion please say aye, or let's raise our hand. Please raise your hand. Uh, that is Councillor Barlow and Councillor Shannon. Um, all those opposed, um, please raise your hand. All right, so that motion fails and the, the, we'll go with the, uh, the aye votes. The aye votes were Councillor Shannon and Barlow. We are now back to uh, the we are now back to the resolution and the short form. Um, and the short form charter question proposal town meeting day 23, version 3, 122 23, as amended. Are there any other amendments? Seeing none and not hearing from any others at the table who wish to make a comment, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed, please say no.
The motion passes unanimously. We have our short language that will be seen on the ballot on town meeting day, which brings us to a public hearing item 7.05, a public hearing regarding waterfront, the Burlington Waterfront Tax Increment Financing District, a substantial change request. Before we get to the public hearing, know that Director Brian Pine of CEDO and our consultant David G. White are present and have worked extensively on this change request. Um, would ask that you um, provide a brief background on this item um, and then we will go to uh, the public hearing. Thank you for being here and patiently waiting for us. Thank you very much. I'm Brian Pine, the Director of the Community and Economic Development Office. With me tonight is David White our consultant, and we'll both say just a few remarks to get this kicked off. Um, tonight we're providing to the council and to the public a overview of the materials that we will be submitting to the Vermont Economic Progress Council, also known as VEPSI, so you'll hear me say VEPSI a few times, um, for a deadline coming up on February 3rd. Uh, that deadline is the last possible date for us as a city to submit the materials to VEPSI before the legislatively mandated deadline to issue bonds uh, coming up in June, June 30th. So just to repeat, this is the last possible opportunity to submit these materials to VEPSI. Uh, the legislation that authorized the extension of the Waterfront TIF District for the three city place or Burlington Town Center parcels, as they were once called, beyond the 2025 expiration uh, of the rest of the Waterfront TIF District to 2035 requires that the city submit a construction contract by the developer of not less than $50 million with a completion guarantee. That is really the central purpose of the proposed application to VEPSI. I should note that the term that VEPSI requires us to use is a substantial change request, so that's what the voters and that's what the public and the council has seen or will see when they look at this. But really, just to clarify, that's a, the project itself, the terms of the project that were agreed to in the ARDA, the Amended and Restated Development Agreement, known as ARDA 2.0, last November, is, is, is exactly what, this, it's the, all the same. There's nothing different. That's, that's what's a little misleading about the term, substantial change. Uh, but I just wanted to, to note that. Um, additionally, VEPSI requires that the city submit materials not just in addition, to, or, or I should say in addition to the contract and the completion guarantee that show that the financial plan is both feasible and viable, that the district holds together from a financial standpoint. Um, this requires that we submit this material by the 3rd and VEPSI will hold a public hearing and the board will deliberate on March 30th. However, they have 60 days to issue a decision. We fully hope and expect that they will issue one sooner. Uh, David will now explain the details and the assumptions that are key to the city's financing plans that VEPSI will be reviewing. I just want to also note that Al Senecal and Patrick O'Brien from City Place Partners are here, but they're not here to make any comments. They're just here with us tonight. So here we go. Here. Suffered. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, again, for the record, I'm David White, President of White & Brook Real Estate Advisors and Consultant to the City on uh, the Waterfront TIF District. and other aspects. Um, so relative to the application to VEPSI, which has been uh, to a large degree my responsibility to coordinate all that and bring the pieces together, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what that entails. So you may recall that um, back in 2016 this council and the voters approved um, uh, bonding and related costs for the BTC project and the three properties involved of uh, $21,830,000 maximum. Now, some of that has already been spent over the intervening years on related costs and other aspects, but the majority of it, the vast majority of it, has not been. It, we've been waiting for a viable project. The application that we will be submitting or we're proposing that you authorize the submission of uh, shows a bonding up to a maximum of $18,840,000. So it's within that $21 million maximum. Um, and in addition to that, uh, related costs. And I'll get to a little bit more detail on that for just a, in just a moment. Um, the 
uh, TIF construction contract, we have been provided by City Place Partners, the developer that's, as we all know, now under construction with the project, or phase one of the project. Uh, they've supplied us with a contract, a construction contract, that's just a hair under $60 million. If I recall correctly, it's $59,750,000. So we're in excess of that minimum threshold. Now, ultimately, they expect the full project to be closer to $180 million in costs um, with all the development. Um, phase two of the project, which would be built on where the um, remaining portion of the mall is that fronts on Church Street, as well as the L.L. Bean building, uh, while we have no detailed estimates uh, internally, we're, we are guesstimating that it will likely be at least $80 million in, in additional construction costs. But construction costs are not the same thing as value. And assessed value is what drives the ability of the city to be able to repay the, the bonding through the TIF process. Working with um, uh, John Vickery, the city assessor, um, he has, uh, estimated a range of possible values depending upon all uh, a number of variables about how the project may come out in the we are taking kind of a middle ground and using a figure of about 120 million dollars compared to the 180 of cost about 120 million dollars of value assessed value upon completion and that's what we're using to drive the um, the cash flow and projections for the ability of the city to repay debt um, phase two Again, we have no value of that at this time. We don't have detailed plans and so forth, but we're guesstimating that will hit about 55 to 60 million in that range. But I want to be clear, we're not relying on phase two for the ability to repay the debt. It's in what we're proposing to show to VEPSI because it's the full picture of where we expect this to go, but we are not relying on that for the debt service. Um, now phase one, which we are relying on, we believe can support about $16 million in debt. That's what the projections show. Um, and uh, that's what we are at the present time estimating we will ultimately bring back to the city council. But I wanna be clear that tonight we're not asking you to actually authorize issuance of the bond or a final bonding amount. We will come back to you later for that We've got a couple of more months before that decision needs to be made. But we've got a cap of 18840000 and a current estimate of, uh, excuse me, $18,840,000 and a current estimate of $16 million of what we'll actually propose. Um, now, related costs are those costs that are involved with managing the TIF district. Um, and previously for this piece of the TIF district, for the BTC piece, 903,000 was authorized by the city council and by the voters and by VEPSI. Um, the way in which it was authorized by the voters though uh, gives the city council the authority to change that, uh, to increase that budget within the context of, as long as it's within the limit of the 21 million. And so part of what we are looking for you to do tonight is to authorize as part of this application a total of 15 million and change, the numbers are in the materials that were supplied. Um, 195,000 of that are actually prior costs that have been accrued but not yet reimbursed to the city. Um, uh, and there's about a million uh, 370 that would be future costs. The final thing I wanna say is that um, important for the public to understand, and I know the city council's already aware of this, is that the, the uh, TIF funds are not just the only money coming in, they are likely to be the minority of money coming in that we, this, the city has already obtained uh, through the good work of the retired Senator Leahy, a $12 million earmark to rebuild uh, Cherry Street all the way from Battery to South Winooski Avenue. And a piece of the TIF money will be used for the required local match for those dollars. So about $3 million out of the 16 that we guesstimate we're gonna be coming back to you to propose, um, the, 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 uh, about 3 million of that will go directly to leverage an additional 12 million. In addition to that, the city has applied for what's called a Reconnecting Communities Grant that will help do pay for the reconnection through St. Paul and Pine Streets, the, uh, the streets that were cut off during the urban renewal area and the reconstruction of Bank Street. And um, 
the, the city applied for about $15 million of that, but at the present time, we don't think we're gonna need the full 15. We think we're gonna need about 10 of that, and we'll need additional matching money, that most of which would also come from the TIF. So that's the quick summation, but again, a reminder, we're not looking for approval of precise bond amount, just the authorization to go to VEPSI with this application at this time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Director Pine, and thank you, David, for that overview. Um, we're here for a public, public hearing, so we will open the public hearing at 1020. Um, I'm gonna look online and see if there are any one who wishes, if there is anyone that's online who wishes to speak during the public hearing, just use the raise hand function. Um, don't know if, if you, if, if, the, if either of the two of you wish to offer any comments at this time. Do you want to say that, do you want to say that up here? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it doesn't appear as though there's anyone online who wishes to speak during the public hearing, so we'll close the public hearing at 1021, um, and we will go to the final item on our agenda, which is 7.06. That's the Waterfront TIF District application to VEPSI for financing of public improvements associated with City Place Burlington. And um, uh, we'll go to Councilor Barlow for a motion. Uh, thank you, President Paul. I move to approve the city's proposed substantial change request to VEPSI for its waterfront TIF district and authorize City Council President Karen Paul and Chief Administrative Officer Catherine Shad to submit and attach uh, submit the attached formal request letter. Thank you, Councilor Barlow. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Um, seconded by Councilor Carpenter. Uh, are there any comments or questions from the council with regard to the motion? Uh, Councilor Carpenter. This is um, specific, but remind me, uh, this will cover the reconstruction of um, Cherry Street from Battery to South Winooski? The, uh, that portion of the project will primarily be covered by the um, congressionally directed spending. The rest of the public infrastructure will be um, reconnecting Pine Street from Bank to Cherry, and the improvements on Bank Street, and then reconnecting St. Paul okay. from Bank to Cherry. Okay. But the end result will repair Cherry. It will be the completely. sidewalks in particular. Absolutely. My friends at Cathedral Square yeah. would like an answer to that. You will have, there will be new sidewalks at, as Thank a result you. of this project. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilor Carpenter. Are there any other councilors who wish to uh, Councilor Bergman to be called by, followed by Councilor Jang? Um, just recently, uh, the mayor's office released something on the, uh, the audit um, on the waterfront TIF district. And so I am just trying to see if there is any connections in terms of the monies that are going to be transferred back into the TIF and this project or just, I mean, I don't like their, us talking about you know, like one waterfront TIF, but we've got all these things, they're not all connected. Sure. So maybe you can just uh, connect some dots since more mo some money is going back into the TIF. How does it relate to all of this? Sure, we, um, I think I'm gonna attempt to respond and then obviously if the mayor has more to add, I think that'd be helpful. I would just say that the, as you know, the audit looked at, at past uh, practices, past performance, past accounting. Um, and so the subject of the audit is, the, is the, the past, if you will, and this is certainly looking prospectively. The reimbursement to the waterfront TIF um, is, uh, from a project viability standpoint, just gives the waterfront TIF um, more resources, essentially, to meet the obligations that the city has already incurred uh, from past bond issuances for the waterfront TIF. So uh, it doesn't have any negative effect at all. Would you say that it would have a, it'll have a positive effect? Essentially, yeah, putting money back into the TIF does mean we can, um, you know, continue to meet the debt obligations that are already um, on, in place for projects like the, the bike path and 
waterfront access north and, and other improvements. Thanks. If I just may add one detail to that, which is that the um, in the cash flow which you've been provided with, I worked as a starting point with the the fund balance that the the state auditor uh, came up with. So we're accepting the state auditor's number and working from there. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. We'll go to Councillor Chang and then to Councillor Hightower. Yep, I think my question was asked by um, Councillor Bergman uh, along those lines and just reassurance. I think that's what we all deserve now and also to remind Councillor Director Pine that there is no past. It's all connected. We are here and we'll continue to pay for the mistake of the past. So it's all connected. Um, and especially when we even have now an, a, a, a TIF consultant, right? I mean, I want reassurance that we are covered on this one before we try to move forward on a vote from your perspective. Sure. The, uh, the great question, I think it gives us a chance to describe the, cons the consultant's scope of services and, um, and David can add perhaps if there's more detail needed, but that the work that David and his firm are doing is, is um, really think of it as the development work that is necessary to put together an application to get through the Vermont Economic Progress Council to then go and be able to issue the bonds. So it's not um, really um, the same as the internal procedures around managing and accounting for um, both expenses and revenues, that is the city's responsibility. David, the consulting firm doesn't play a role in that. But I would add that um, CAO Shad recognized um, immediately upon her arrival that the uh, capital accounting systems of the city needed some um, upgrading and um, brought on Municap pretty much right away to bring their expertise managing TIF districts all across the country to the city. And so the the, the improvements which even the auditor noted um, are in place now to prevent um, future accounting mistakes from occurring. Yeah, so my question is um, the um, the city's own auditor did prescribe some strategies and recommendations. So M Mr. David White does not have any correlation with that, does not even look at those, and he just look into the development. Yeah. So uh, as uh, Director Pine said, you know, my work is to look at moving forward, but I do connect, I absolutely agree, the past is an important part and connected intricately with where we are, and that's the key element, um, the reason why I'm, I chimed in a moment ago regarding um, the the beginning point for my projections. I developed the projections personally, I did that work personally, but I started with the number that the state auditor determined was the correct fund balance for the district. Anything that led up to that, I've not been involved with, uh, but um, the CAO, Shad, and Municap, the consultant on the operational side as opposed to the development side, which is my piece, They've been working on that together, and my understanding, but again, I'm not involved in that earlier piece, is that they now have procedures in place to address the issues that have been raised. But I want to assure you that I've worked from the numbers that the state auditor determined, and that's what's reflected in what we're seeking approval for tonight for submission to VEPSI. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chang. We'll go to Councillor Hightower and then possibly a vote so that we don't have to extend our, extend our rules. Sorry. I just had my That's okay. <laughs> Take your time. Um, I unfortunately have the similar line of questioning as Councillor Bergman and Councillor Jang, which is we started with the cash that the auditor says is on hand, but did we change our accounting method processes to make sure that um, the next year accounting is now in line with our updated ICC. <laughs> Shad nodding her head yes, so I'll take that. Um, and then the second question that I had was, I know that 
Mayor Weinberger disagreed with a component of the audit that had to do with the legislators. And I just don't know if that is an ongoing dispute that is audit related, that, that is accounting related that we're looking to settle. And if so, if we're how we're adjusting for the risk of that dispute being not settled in our favor and needing to account for it later. I'd be happy to uh, answer that question. It, it is, um, uh, let me start by saying if that question I think is completely separate from the matter at hand for, for, for this reason. The, the, um, the audit um, <clears throat> it basically says there's, there's a lot in the audit. There's, there are many findings and there's, there's, a, there's a lot in there, but the kind of biggest financial kind of immediate impacts are that there is a uh, transfer um, back to the TIF district, strengthening of the TIF district of um, more than a million dollars. And so that is additional funds that are in, in the, that will be in the TIF district when we make these adjustments that will, and it's that that David White is saying he's based uh, the future projections off of. The disagreement regarding the um, question of whether the city, whether further money is owed to the education fund is not a TIF district question. It's a question of whether um, uh, the, um, uh, I, I believe whether we, the general fund would be responsible for um, up to close to $200,000 of, of additional payments. Um, and there, uh, the dispute, if you will, at least the disagreement is that there is an ongoing process um, involving, and really our main objection there is that the auditor characterized what has happened there as errors um, where uh, by the city, um, when in fact uh, um, the discrepancies they are largely due to the state's software and the way that it interacts with um, the city's uh, property tax system. And we've had awareness of this since the audit process has been going on and there's been uh, uh, an effort to work with the state and the private contractor that's responsible for the software to get these ironed out. Part of that is ongoing and so Really, our main objection was to the characterization of these as city errors, and uh, we think it's premature to say exactly where this is all going to kind of sugar off because there is still work ongoing. There's a smaller subset of that that has to do with an uh, ongoing dispute about the way in which um, a specific garage was taxed. <clears throat> all that to say is, so there is a possibility, a very, um, significant possibility that there will be an additional payment that will need to be made by the city uh, to the Ed Fund. Um, it will not impact the waterfront TIF uh, calculations or the, the, the projections that um, uh, we're working off of. Um, and further, just to the degree, uh, just want to reemphasize that the vote being made tonight is to submit this application, not to make any kind of financial commitments around the uh, what what new commitments the TIF district is taking on. So, to the degree, there's still further time for that. Thanks. That's still, I think, helpful context for understanding this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower, uh, Councillor Travers. Thank you, President Paul. Just uh, very briefly here, um, a, a number of my colleagues, understandably given the news of the day, have questions about the Waterfront TIP District, but I, I want to take an opportunity here um, to really express how excited I am about the work that's underway uh, downtown, uh, to thank the team that's here for their ongoing commitment to our community. Uh, I will enthusiastically be supporting this request of FC tonight to secure the public improvements associated with this project and looking forward, uh, I, I look forward to continuing to do whatever I can within reason uh, to continue to assist this project and seeing it through to completion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Travers. Uh, seeing no other comments. Uh, I'm sorry, did you want to, I'm, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, um, I, I Director Pine. I just Pine. wanted to highlight something that I, I believe I'm pretty sure it's in the memo. I hope it landed in there, I'm almost positive. 
The district, uh, for the rest of the districts, not these parcels, ends in 2025. And beginning in that year, that fiscal year, the general fund revenue increases by 750,000 annually beginning then. So it's a, it's a good news in terms of forecasting ahead. It is a little bit down the road, but it is something beneficial about the whole nature of the TIF. It does grow the grand list to provide support for all the general fund services that, and, that we rely on. Thanks. It'll be here before we know it. Uh, with that and seeing no other comments for the council, from the council, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion is made by Councillor Barlow and seconded by Councillor Carpenter. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously um, with our thanks to both of you and support for the project moving forward. That completes our deliberative agenda, and with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Uh, by Councillor McGee and seconded by uh, Councillor Brandt. Brandt. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, please say no. We are adjourned at 1035. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Our next meeting will be on February 6th.